Damit ihr Herrat. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to open the fifth Fermi Energy Conference titled Smart People, Smart Energy. No doubt nuclear energy requires intellectual effort uh, as a, a type of energy that is suitable for smart countries. And the goal of today's conference is to find out what knowledge do we need in order to start using nuclear energy, and is Estonia ready for that? Estonia is known around the world for a few things. I, like many people interested in tech and living in San Francisco, knew of Estonia for its brilliant children, high PISA test exam scores, um, genius IT entrepreneurs, and its uh, entrepreneurial spirit in the face of a hard history that might cause other peoples to give up. I had to come here to Estonia to learn about the pristine nature and the environment. And I have to tell you, and I've talked to other people who say the same thing, when you see the Estonian flag and for the first time somebody explains to you how the white of the snow, the black of the trees, and the blue of the sky uh, were chosen to represent this pristine natural environment, you learn why it must be protected. So here to describe, uh, open the conference today and to describe the importance of nuclear for the environment, we have the Minister of Climate of the nation of Estonia, uh, Kristen Mikal. Good morning. Good morning, people from Estonia, from abroad. By way of introduction, Uh, I think we should think uh, like that. As a state and as a nation, we have uh, followed quite a long journey in Estonia. When we look at the um, energy and the way how we do things, then all of this has been done differently for decades. But when we look at our great goals, and, and we have this yes news yesterday uh, that Europe uh, is describing its 2040 goals. And among those um, goals, we have been having quite a good, moving on with quite a good pace, which does not mean that we have done everything. Uh, on the contrary, we are just on the middle of the road still. And my message today is that uh, in earlier times, the energy sector was an inevitable problem to some extent, at least in some regions. And we have been accepting this, that in uh, Ida Viruma, the um, life expectancy of a child born uh, is five years uh, less than in Tartor in Tallinn. But then uh, f in future, the energy is going to be cleaner. The environmental footprint will be smaller. And um, we can generate products and services with the potential of exports on all those markets where that we want to uh, uh, reach. And our main export markets are here in the Scandinavian countries. And they always ask, what is the environmental footprint of this product? And what is the story behind the product that we are offering? And as a result, uh, it is no secret in, when it comes to Estonia that we have uh, taken certain goals. One of them is the 2030 goals, then the subsequent goals. And by 2030, we want all energy consumed in Estonia comes from renewable sources. And this discussion goes on in the government and also in the society. Uh, and we should ask ourselves, is uh, Mm, this all we uh, accept, but I think that we have to set the la uh, uh, our goals even higher. If we want to have cleaner energy, if we want to 
uh, have more added value. This is what we always aspire towards, and that means that energy has to meet these goals as well. And I think that the um, energy uh, or nuclear energy report, which is going to be discussed today in several presentations as well, will serve as a foundation for this discussion. So I'll tell you in a few words how this process is going to continue. I know that many people have come from the climate uh, sector today, and they will know exactly uh, what this report is all about. But the main thing is that in a parliamentary republic, parliament, the parliament decides, even if it seems sometimes that the debate in parliament is not to somebody's liking, or the member of parliament is not to somebody's liking, or the discussion is not to somebody's liking, but still the parliament is the main place where decisions are made. And uh, this also applies to future energy and uh, the choice of uh, nuclear power. And uh, the decision to the beginning of uh, generation of energy takes about 10 years to develop. So it all depends on how fast we are going to manage all the different things that need to be done. And I saw here different members of the parliament here, and we all have the same responsibility to uh, conduct this debate in the Estonian parliament, and it has to be a uh, knowledge-based debate. And this is what our report is all about. If we are discussing um, the basis of our future economy in uh, Estonia, that all has to be based on knowledge. And when it comes to nuclear energy, there are advantages, stability, security, future options, but there are also different duties and tasks. That means that the state has to invest in people, which is not bad at all. We have to acquire knowledge. We have to make all those decisions concerning uh, readiness and security, all those other things. So I would say that uh, uh, whatever debate we are going to have over this issue should lead to a qualified decision. And only then we can, on the government level, continue with the preparations. So when you ask about uh, expectations, then my expectation mm, to, our, to my uh, employer, the government, and the government's employer is the parliament and the Estonian people on the top of them. So after we have had this debate, uh, got the decision, uh, and then form a position, then we can continue. Uh, so if the decision is that nuclear energy has a place in our uh, uh, energy portfolio and in developing our economy, then I think personally uh, that there's room for uh, every uh, type of energy, uh, renewables, nuclear, if we want to build our future on a cleaner, securer basis. I would like to put... Uh, picture here that I've been showing before, and keep this in mind, that despite the fact that uh, in Estonia mm, we have quite um, nice cool weather, it is generally cool in Estonia, but it does not mean that the world is not suffering from all sorts of problems, climate crisis, we should deal with these issues, we should have energy that produces a smaller footprint uh, that should also uh, uh, be cleaner, that uh, keep our cl planet, our nature cleaner as well. This is what I would like to say by way of introduction. And I would like to emphasize once again that whatever discussions and decisions we are making, they all should be based on knowledges, knowledge. And uh, this report serves as a good basis for that. Uh, and discussions are very welcome. Nobody ever thinks that uh, our ministry does not uh, think uh, so either that I shouldn't. We shouldn't think that our knowledge is the best. If someone has better knowledge, then we are definitely ready to go and look into them. But in the society, in politics, uh, in the businesses, everything has to be based on knowledge and facts. So have a great day today, and have a knowledge-based debate. Fermi energia jälgib kõrgendatud huviga, kuidas... 
Fermi Energia is following very carefully how SMRs are developed in the world. But now I would like to give the floor to Todd Smith, Ontario Province Energy Minister. Please. I'm here to have the opportunity to speak to you, even though I'm unable to join you in person today. Before I begin, I want to say how much I enjoyed my recent visit to COP28 in Dubai as part of my second international nuclear trade mission. COP28 was truly an historic opportunity for the nuclear sector. For the first time ever, nuclear energy was front and center, and we saw government and industry leaders from around the world coming together to sign an historic declaration to triple nuclear energy capacity to help us reach net zero by 2050. I was especially pleased to meet with Estonia's Secretary General of the Ministry of Climate, Keith Kazimitz, to discuss Ontario's nuclear expertise and our collaboration on small modular reactor deployment. With Ontario's world-class nuclear supply chain and experienced nuclear operators, we are uniquely positioned to support SMR development and deployment. And we're proud to be leading the way on SMR development, including plans to deploy the G7s first grid-scale SMR project at Ontario Power Generation's Darlington New Nuclear Site. In addition, last summer, I announced that our government would be working with OPG to proceed with the planning and licensing for three additional SMRs for a total of four small modular reactors at Darlington. Once deployed, we expect the four SMR units to produce a total of 1,200 megawatts of electricity, equivalent to powering 1.2 million homes. And these advancements are necessary as Ontario's population is expected to grow by 2 million people over the coming decade and as our economy expands. And this includes more than $27 billion in new global investments from automakers and manufacturers of electric vehicle batteries and battery materials. In addition to providing affordable, reliable and clean energy for our province, we're also in a position to help Estonia and other countries around the world achieve energy independence and meet your climate goals. Just last week, I was in Alberta for an announcement with Capital Power and OPG to explore SMRs to serve Alberta's power grid on Canada's west coast. It's truly exciting to see other jurisdictions pursuing clean technology, and it's also a reminder of the great experience and expertise that Ontario can share with the world. That's why I was so pleased when Estonia's Fermi Energia chose GE Hitachi's SMR technology, the BWRX300, for deployment in Estonia and specifically cited the Darlington SMR project as a factor in their selection decision. Nuclear power has a vital role to play in the future of our planet. That's why in addition to SMR development, Ontario is continuing the refurbishment of our existing CANDU nuclear reactors at the Darlington and Bruce nuclear generating stations, while also beginning pre-development work with Bruce Power to site the first large-scale new nuclear build in more than 30 years. With our decades of nuclear experience with CANDU reactors, our world-class nuclear supply chain, and our groundbreaking work on SMRs, Ontario is excited to share our nuclear expertise with you and the rest of the world. And as more jurisdictions recognize that nuclear power is essential to a clean energy future, we look forward to working with you and other leaders to further advance the growing international nuclear industry. Thank you. We have Justin Friedman uh, from the U.S. Uh, Department of uh, uh, Def uh, Department of Defense, and he's going to give us a welcome. Minister Michal, Minister Smith, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Tere. My name is Justin Friedman, and I'm Senior Advisor in the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be with you virtually to help open today's conference. I want to thank Kalev Kamenetz and Fermi Energia for the invitation to speak with you today. I'm just sorry that I could not be with you in person as you discuss the very important subject of the role of nuclear energy in Estonia and around the world. My message to you is simple. Energy security is national security. 
the United States believes that as NATO allies and strong partners, Estonia and the United States can work together with our like-minded partners to achieve energy security through a diversity of energy sources. We also believe that we must work together to address the climate challenge by rapidly developing carbon-free sources of energy. This is where civil nuclear energy can play an important role. Partnered with other clean, renewable energy sources, nuclear energy can provide clean, reliable baseload energy to stabilize the electric grid. Technologies on the market today, including small modular reactors or SMRs, using light water and fourth generation technologies have many additional uses, including providing high temperature heat for industrial processes, water desalination, and carbon-free hydrogen generation. This gets me to why Kalev asked me to speak to you. Where do we get a lot of our heat today? From coal and other hydrocarbons. SMRs are being developed and deployed today to replace coal in all these roles. In the US, our Department of Energy has supported technology development and commercialization of these SMRs. Internationally, the United States is working with partners like Estonia to explore the role nuclear can play in their energy mix through our program called the Foundational Infrastructure for the Responsible Use of SMR Technology, or FIRST, we are providing access to unbiased, technology-neutral, and vendor-neutral expertise. Under FIRST, we launched Project Phoenix, a competitively selected partnering program to provide focused support in countries that want to take the next step in exploring how to make the coal to nuclear transition. We have announced that Poland, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia have launched projects under this program, and a number of other countries are receiving support as well. I want to go back and emphasize the word responsible in the FIRST program. Our goal with FIRST, as with all cooperation with the U.S. government, is to support the development of civil nuclear energy to the highest standards of safety, security, and nonproliferation. That's what responsible means. Estonia has been a wonderful, responsible partner in our first program since 2021. We commend Estonia's Nuclear Energy Working Group for their dedication and hard work over the past two years. Their report delivers a thorough and informative assessment of the potential of nuclear energy in Estonia and, importantly, the factors that should guide the debate. We support a healthy, informed, and inclusive debate on civil nuclear energy. Estonia's decision should be a well-considered one that evaluates multiple perspectives. I'm honored that the United States is working with Estonia as you consider what role you may want nuclear energy to play in your country. And I'm excited about the potential for us to deepen our partnership through clean, safe, reliable, carbon-free nuclear energy. Thank you. Aita. Well, thank you very much to Ministers Mikhail and to uh, Minister Smith. I have to say, as an American, I'm thrilled to see this level of co cooperation already happening. Um, I'm excited by the level of interest I hear in America in working with countries around the world. And I have to tell you, coming from outside of Estonia, I and many others are eagerly awaiting to hear exactly where the Estonian SMR deployment program is going. And from that, we have uh, Chairman of the Board of Fermi Energia, Sander Lieve, to update all of us. Good morning. Krister Michal, thank you for your good words. Knowledge-based decisions in the Parliament. This is important. When I was driving up here and actually also uh, after uh, lunch, uh, well, after dinner yesterday, I put uh, on my tel uh, television and I could see uh, the discussion in the uh, parliament about uh, uh, renewable energy. And uh, this discussion is underway in the 
groups of uh, the parliament. And when they are speaking about uh, renewable energy, they also mention nuclear energy. And I would also like to thank Todd Smith for uh, giving the overview uh, about Ontario. He's been to Estonia as well. I think it was about two years ago or uh, 18 months ago. So he's a real uh, mm, expert on uh, uh, nuclear energy. At first he mentioned one uh, SMR, but now he's already speaking about four. And when with Kalev Kalemets last November, we went to Darlington. Then we could see the preparations underway, although the uh, uh, concrete has not been laid down yet. But there was there were there was an, a lot of uh, trucks um, removing earth. So the preparations are really underway in Darlington. Uh, people in Estonia, when we speak about. Uh, Nuclear energy. We speak about. Uh, we turn to all Estonian people. Uh, welcome to the fifth conference of Fermi Energia. Last year, we uh, publish publicized our choice of technology. It is the General Electric Hitachi 300 milliwatt um, boiling water reactor. Todd Smith already mentioned that the uh, the Capital Group of Alberta is. Uh, uh, considering the same um, technology, and uh, Alberta is kind of similar to our Ita Viruma in Estonia. Uh, so they also consider uh, starting using the modular reactors. And Sask Power in Saskatchewan province also had made, has made the same decision. So the Canada is really ambitious about starting using small modular reactors. And Todd Smith also mentioned that nuclear energy and its development is directly related to uh, secure, affordable, and uh, clean energy. And uh, the industrial investments need uh, to be sure they come to places where there is such energy available. Maybe I'll be discussing the technology at length, but the important thing is that already in the USA, the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Polish Oil and Synthes Green Energy has decided uh, to choose this um, technology. And I'm mentioning this just to show you that we have made the right decision. We had new scale. Uh, Utah project uh, is not uh, going to be continued. Estonia has its own experience with Utah uh, and energy. Then Rolls-Royce was the third choice. But I think they still don't have any clients. So uh, the boiling water reactor is more secure, and, uh, and the more uh, clients are choosing this, the bigger the possibility that uh, it will become finally uh, 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 operational and the prices will be better as well. But let's get back now to Estonian business. Many things have happened in Estonia in one year and many things have become clearer as well. Uh, Christian Michal already mentioned that the, the final report of the Nuclear Energy Working Group was completed. Well, it is quite clear for us from this report uh, that uh, Estonia has uh, good preconditions for a successful nuclear program. And we are going to hear from Antti Toming in uh, greater detail about this. But I really like to thank all the members of the working group for this major work undertaken. I do not think there has been any um, working group manned by the state, uh, represented by all ministries, apart from the uh, Ministry of Culture, I think, and maybe the Rural Ministry or Agricultural Ministry. But the work was not only important for Estonia. It has been noticed elsewhere as well. And Reli Karunnel 
she is over somewhere. I saw that she already made a vi- paid a visit to Singapore and shared uh, uh, our experience on how to go about uh, considering nuclear energy in uh, in a country. So this already has made us bigger, or Esto- has been has made Estonia bigger. I've always said, uh, or spoken about the price of electricity in my speech. So the average. Um, Uh, electricity price last year was 91 euros per megawatt hours, uh, but at the same time it was 56 euros per in Finland. What does that tell us? Namely, there is a two times difference in prices, which shows clearly that bottlenecks still exist between different markets, and the Estonian clients. And for Estonian clients, it is very important, and there's a big difference whether the investment is made in Finland or in Estonia. If we cannot get cheap energy here in Estonia, and uh, we cannot uh, set the price, fix the price for more than a year ahead, and in 2020, uh, the average electricity price was 32 euros, and when we even hedge it for a year. It will still be the same. So, and thirdly, the risk that uh, uh, underwater connections might be broken for a long time, and like remember last October there was this uh, accident, of an uh, anchor pulled uh, and and broke the um, telecommunication cable and also the gas connector between Estonia and Finland, and. Um, And there's also between them Estlink one. Uh, why was this not broken? Because this was uh, uh, buried into the uh, sea mud. And uh, Indre Karna was uh, the company that created Estlink one. And uh, he proposed that uh, in addition to the 100 million, we add uh, 2 million euros and bury the cable into the sea mud. And it seemed to be a good investment back then, and we can see this today, given that Estlink 2 has, uh, is not working. The reasons have not been figured out yet. Kalle Gilk, I think, was uh, yesterday in the studio uh, in TV, on TV. Uh, I couldn't uh, follow this, but I've heard that uh, it is out of service up until f- February, which means that the connections sometimes may break or fail, and for a long time. Fourth, what we have learned, the support to start using uh, nuclear energy uh, is very high now, 69%. And for the first time, nuclear energy turned out to be the most preferred type of energy, um, overcoming even uh, wind energy by 5%. And the solar energy uh, is still uh, lower when it comes to popularity. But interestingly, uh, oil shale energy uh, uh, also uh, got more support, again, around 30% or so. It is a fact that nuclear energy and support to this 69%, and when you ask people what type of energy you support, then people most support most nuclear energy. Uh, This survey is conducted every six months, and this shows us that a smart, democratic people can also choose smart energy. We have Uh, also many members of parliament present today here, and it would be really surprising if the members of parliament would not take into account what the people want and think. Um, I would also like to praise Esti Energia with the new name of Enefit uh, for finally starting building the Totsi wind farm. This is the first large investment uh, after 10 years. I will not mention the smaller ones in Portsa and elsewhere. But so there was a more than 10-year break 
between these investments. Anto Leppiman started the development of the Tootsi uh, wind farm in 2010. I think he's present here today as well. So it took 13 years to actually launch the project. And even back then, in 2010, when Anto came up with the proposal, then uh, the, there were no su subsidies offered for renewable energy at that point. But, uh, well, it took some time, 13 years, and now there we are. So the Tootsi Sopi 350 megawatts will be completed by the end of this year or early next year. Sixth, uh, the price of uh, battery storage uh, uh, was uh, established finally. Esti Energia came out with this information. They are creating a um, uh, storage facility uh, of 53 megawatt hours. So, uh, but it is 25 megawatts per hour, a few hours. Uh, will be, be uh, possible, mm, and it costs 20 million euros. I made a small calculation. Uh, we have 2,000 megawatt hours of daily consumption, and uh, I calculated that it is only good for two minutes and two seconds. Uh, a few weeks ago with Kolev, we went to the parliament to speak uh, about our nuclear energy, and then they also asked us, what about storage? So let's take this 32 gigawatt hours per day. So how much would you have to invest in order to get a one day electricity uh, in, uh, in the summer, uh, in the winter, uh, 12 billion. But it's not only the problem of high price of the storage, uh, uh, but Next day, also, there is no electricity. So I do uh, support um, battery uh, storage uh, or hydro pump stations. But we have to understand that they have to store and then give electricity in the 24-hour cycle. So we can only use this for a few hours. So this is not a solution uh, uh, that where we could store the summer energy that is left over and use it in the winter. So there is no long-term solution. Yes, the batteries and uh, hydro pumps, they help to smooth out the peaks during a day. But when we look at the frequency markets and all sorts of unexpected events, then as Fermi Energia, we support all the storage issues. But let's be realistic. This the, the summer uh, sunshine and wind uh, uh, cannot be used uh, over a long period in winter. Uh, and it is not feasible economically, sadly. There are ideas, but uh, nothing has happened yet. Yes, there are high hopes for uh, hydrogen. Let's speak about hydrogen. 92 million tons of uh, hydrogen is being used um, in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, mostly for industrial purposes, and the assumption is that uh, uh, um, consumption is going to increase. But let's calculate some more. It is quite clear that in the course of decarbonization, we have to turn the hydrogen also green, uh, and uh, we need energy for that. Uh, and. Uh, the energy needed for that is constant. You cannot change this. But simply said, in order to replace this 8.2 million tons of uh, hydrogen uh, and to replace this with green uh, hydrogen, we would need 52 gigawatt hours of electricity during the whole year, which means 52 times the Estonian consumption in the EU uh, we, we, we need today 52 times more, uh, 50 time, 52 times Estonian consumption in order to get green uh, hydrogen. This is huge, and which means that if in one um, wind uh, generator you also generate uh, hydrogen, then there is a more uh, feasible market uh, for use than just uh, turning this back into electricity. So 
when we look at the security of supply long term, then we only have uh, one solution. We have to build new production facilities for generating electricity. This is just like it is. Let's now look at Fermi Energia. So what we have learned during the year, I spoke about that already. And I think what I mentioned were the most important ones. So we've been uh, working for five years in developing this project, gathered knowledge, studied things, have become wiser. But again, members of parliament, uh, you now, the t- uh, you have to decide, discuss and decide. You have been chosen by the people and the Estonian people pay your salaries. So by today, we are in a a phase where we need to have the state to make the decision in order to start using or developing nuclear energy. Uh, Then the next logical step would be location, and then uh, its approval by using the special planning process by the state. And um, it would take about four years. Always they ask, uh, uh, how long is it going to take? But the main thing is, when is it that we start first? As a private uh, company using investors' monies, uh, we cannot uh, take upon ourselves things that the state needs to do. And even if it takes, it, if it takes four or four and a half years, Sometimes it is possible also to save some time. But uh, at the same time as the special planning is carried out, uh, the legislation has to be uh, uh, developed, uh, the nuclear safety department has to be formed, national competences have to be created. And once the location has been decided, then there's uh, applications for safety and construction permits. That could also take two years. And, and planning takes a long time, but the builders also ask for time. So when we put all the money, all the time needed together, then um, uh, the G- Hitachi uh, representative said that uh, uh, that uh, 20, 36 months and 24 months, well, it's good if it is going to happen like that. But when we uh, ca- put together all the different uh, steps, then maybe nine to 11 years uh, up on when we are realistic, we could be ready at 2035, unless uh, something unexpected happens. The planning takes time, takes money, and takes an energy. But no single and important change for the sake of a better future does not come free. So, but the work that has to be uh, done is not a reason why not decide for a better future. And very often when people speak about nuclear energy, they say it's complicated, it's expensive, takes some time. But uh, no one has ever said that it is, that it is impossible. When we learn, we start to understand complicated things better. And when we learn from others, then we can uh, create our nuclear plant in Estonia uh, faster and uh, cheaper uh, than the Canadian Canadian people in Darlington. Also, we can learn from the regulators' experience in Finland, Sweden, and Canada. Everyone can uh, learn what the main truths and special nature of nuclear energy is. Uh, And I think that Estonia is ready for a smart uh, nuclear energy, and Estonia is able to create a better future for itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandor Liva. And before the next presentation, I have a small recommendation uh, to our audience. If you would like to ask questions, you can do it using Slido. 
app. And here you can also see uh, uh, the uh, guidelines for asking the question. Greg Feed is vice president of Eken Group, and his presentation is about Darlington um, project with the first uh, BWRX 300. Uh, is more in the world, and as Estonia has chosen the same technical solution, then we will listen to his presentation. Welcome, Greg Wheat. Good morning. Um, unlike Sandor, I can't get away with one slide, so I've got some photos to, to share and some videos. Um, but I'm excited and honored to be here today uh, to share the celebration of five years uh, with Fermi Energia. Uh, also share a little bit about who we are, uh, the, the situation in Canada, the exciting project that Todd Smith talked about, uh, delivering the first BWRX 300, and our ambitions to support deployment. So uh, I'll quickly run through this. I'll start with a video about ourselves, give you some context, and then I'll finish up with a construction video, which I think you'll, you'll enjoy. <clears throat> Icon is a North American construction and infrastructure development company with global expertise, transforming vision into reality. Today we proudly deliver some of the most complex infrastructure projects in the world, harnessing the strengths of Acon's capabilities across its diverse operating sectors. Acon is strategically focused on delivering projects linked to the energy transition, decarbonization, and sustainability. Acon is at the forefront of delivering infrastructure that will provide clean, reliable, and affordable energy for generations to come. Our nuclear experience spans more than five decades in over 400 nuclear projects, providing a full spectrum of nuclear services for refurbishment, maintenance, new build, decommissioning, modularization, and fabrication to power a sustainable future. From ongoing projects where we are executing life extension programs for the two largest refurbishment projects in North America, to delivering the first grid-scale SMR in the Western world, Acon's people are at the heart of everything we do. Acon is committed to building a diverse and talented workforce and provides an equitable and inclusive workplace that values the contributions of all employees. We are focused on safety, schedule, cost performance, and operational excellence, backed by a long-standing quality management program, in-depth project management experience, and exacting standards. At Acon, we're building smarter, we're drawing on the latest technology to shape the future of construction and find innovative solutions to today's most formidable infrastructure challenges. Acon has demonstrated success in delivering complex nuclear projects safely, on time, on schedule, and with excellent quality through continuously incorporating unit over unit lessons learned. Leveraging continuous improvement, this experience and success sets Acon apart to play an important role in successfully deploying the next generation of nuclear plants using a similar fleet execution strategy. Moving forward, the successful delivery of SMRs and large-scale new nuclear builds are integral to Acon's nuclear offering. Aligning with global net zero targets, SMRs and large-scale nuclear builds will play a critical role in advancing progress towards a net zero economy. With an agile one Acon culture and a skilled workforce that is guided by our core values, safety first, integrity, accountability, and inclusion, Acon is well positioned to harness the collective strengths of all of its operating sectors to advance the opportunities associated with the deployment of new nuclear technology. Through experience working under traditional and collaborative contracting models, such as integrated project delivery and alliances, Acon has demonstrated capabilities in early stage project development and pre-planning, development or validation phases, and construction execution using a project first mindset. Acon proudly extends this collaboration to provide benefits to local communities, including building capacity in local supply chains, creating jobs, and building meaningful, mutually beneficial relationships with indigenous communities. Acon is at the forefront of building nuclear infrastructure, continuing to extend the life of existing nuclear stations while harnessing the benefits of nuclear new builds to enable future generations to thrive. That feels like a, a shameless sales pitch, but it's really not. I'm quite proud of the work that we do. The projects that we take on are, are really close to our heart. Uh, our people are fully engaged, and 
Uh, we love the, uh, the story that Estonia has, so we're happy to be here today. Um, just to give you a bit of context in terms of uh, the, the background with regards to Canada and how we arrived at selecting um, new nuclear technology. You heard Todd Smith, our Minister of Energy. He's quite a big advocate for us. He's a powerhouse for the industry. He understands it, and he's very well connected. I'm very happy that he comes here to Estonia and, and shares our story, but also looks for opportunities to support. Uh, back in uh, two, uh, 2020, we had a pan-Canadian SMR roadmap, which aligned government, industry, operators, and stakeholders to make sure that we actually have a, a clear understanding of the opportunity. And really what that translated into was actually a Pathways to Decarbonization report. And in this report, what it did was it actually took a look at where we are today with regards to our current capacity and the energy mix that we have in Ontario today, which is roughly about 60% nuclear. By 2050, we've got to over double that capacity. A big part of that will be investments in technologies outside of nuclear, but there's quite a daunting challenge ahead of us. And the BWX300 is, is a piece of where Ontario wants to get to, to to close that gap. So if you look at today's capacity that will still be in operation by 2050, it's just a little under 9,000 megawatts. So what that means is, is that we've got an additional 18,000 megawatts of new nuclear generation that we have to bring online. So the SMR, the four pack at Darlington, we're excited about. We know that the world's watching. We have to make sure that the first project is successful and be able to leverage that, uh, that experience. Uh, today, actually, I just took a snapshot last night, I think around 2 in the morning. But right now, nuclear is uh, roughly 50% of our current generation in Ontario. And that's because uh, what we have is we've got a number of units offline. We're going through refurbishment. But it should be around 60% on a, on a normal operating day. Uh, in terms of background, it's important to understand that, uh, that ACON has taken on a quite significant role in the refurbishment of 10 CANDU reactors in Ontario. There are six reactors at Bruce Power. There's four reactors that we're over halfway through at Darlington. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to showcase that we've been able to plan and execute on time and on schedule a very complex, first-of-a-kind uh, refurbishment activities. And the province of Ontario has invested $26 billion into that project. And what we've been able to show as an industry is we've been able to rally around uh, the operators, the supply chain, and the resources to be able to deliver on our, on our, uh, on our commitments. Uh, a little bit about our teaming approach, so we don't do things alone. Uh, Kalev and I and the rest of the Acon team have talked a little bit about partnerships. Uh, they're very important to what we do. We don't pretend to take things on by ourselves. We, we know what our capabilities are. We know what we do well. But we also know what our shortcomings are. And so in each of these uh, major refurbishments, what we have is we've got joint ventures that we've established with partners. And so what we have is complementary partnerships to be able to make sure that we've got the right partners, we've got the capacity and the knowledge to be able to take on the challenges, but also be able to work through some of the challenges because we know these projects don't go always swimmingly well. Um, in terms of the BWX300, uh, what's different about a new build for ACON is that historically what we've done within the nuclear sector is we've delivered refurbishment, very isolated. But what we can now do is we can actually take a look at leveraging four of our operating sectors, of our five, to bring that knowledge, those skills, those expertise to building a new, new, uh, new reactor in Ontario. So a little bit about the, uh, the SMR um, arrangement that we have. It's an integrated project delivery model, OPG being the owner, uh, GE Itachi, obviously, the technology developer. And then what we work uh, with uh, Atkins Realis, who's the architect engineer, and ourselves as the, uh, as the constructor. In terms of where the project is today, I think uh, most importantly, we've uh, done a lot of work over the last uh, two years. Uh, we're working towards a class three estimate uh, by the end of 2024. Uh, but what we are is we're on track for a license to construct by the end of this year, as well as early construction start uh, by, the, uh, by the start of 2025. Now, what that does include is also quite a bit of site preparation. So if you were to come to the Ontario Power Generation site, you'd see that the, uh, the earth has been flattened, that's being prepped, and even a portion of the shaft will start actually this year. So it's quite exciting times to actually see the progress that's happening, uh, but we're still working through the regulatory approval process uh, with, uh, with GE Itachi and, uh, and OPG. Uh, in terms of the commitment that Todd Smith talked about, uh, great news for us, it's not just one unit. Uh, it's four, and I think as we all know, you don't just build one SMR, it, uh, you want to build uh, a fleet of them. Uh, so we're excited about the timeline here and the commitment that uh, the province of Ontario has made, and it allows us to be able to take a look at how do we spin up our, our teams, 
the supply chain and the capacity to be able to support a four-unit build. When you're dealing with a one-unit build, you know, it's very narrow, it's very focused, and we know that that's uh, mission critical for our success. Uh, but we also have opportunities when you take a look at a multi-unit site. You've got supply chain efficiencies, you've got investments that you can justify, you're not trying to burden all the cost in one unit. So there's quite a bit of work that's going on to take a look at what does a program look like versus a one-unit project. Um, this is a snapshot that I was shared, uh, shared earlier this week about our successes in 2023. I won't go through this in great detail, uh, but you can see, uh, starting on the left, that we've got uh, early works that, uh, that's been completed. We've got 165 new, new employees that are full-time on the project that was ramped up uh, in the last year. Uh, we've got, obviously, the commitment of four reactors. Uh, we've got uh, a number of interactions with community, uh, up, up to 10,000. Uh, $236 million uh, spent to progress our project. And so what you can see is you can see a number of the, the milestones that have actually been, been accomplished uh, last year. So quite excited and quite proud of the team in terms of being able to progress. The next couple of slides I want to share with you, it's a little bit more of a technical detail, but I think that's part of the story that we tell. Um, it's easy to throw slides up and talk about we're going first. Uh, I can talk a little bit about it, but it's always better to show pictures. So uh, I'll quickly go through some of this, but what we've been able to showcase as a constructor and be involved early in the project is be able to add value. So typically in these contracts or typically in these projects, we're involved later on after the engineering has been sufficiently developed and designed. But we've actually provided an opportunity to showcase value, uh, which goes back to the actual re reactor design itself with G-Hitachi. So I'll talk a little bit about these, uh, these yellow segments here. And what they are is they're, they're steel, uh, Lego pieces, if you will, that will be fabricated off-site, and they'll be shipped to site for larger, larger assembly, modularization, and uh, fit up in the field. Our team has a research and development center. It's a welding center of excellence. We're quite knowledgeable on nuclear welding, very specialized alloys. And what we've been doing over the last 12 months is we've been actually running prototypes. We've had the opportunity to take a look at the initial design, the complexities of it, the challenges. And actually, we've been able to provide feedback to G-Itachi. We've been able to actually influence the design based on our learnings to be able to say, these are quite challenging the way that they're designed. There's opportunities to reduce risk, reduce schedule, reduce cost, and really make sure that we've got a good quality product so that when it is designed, we can manufacture it, install it with high confidence. So you'll see here some of the photos of the mock-ups. Uh, these are actually quite large. The one on the left is about four feet tall. It's the actual bottom of the, uh, the reactor. It's called the base mat. Um, but what we have is we've got uh, prototypes and application engineering that, uh, that our teams are working through. Uh, you'll see here, this is a portion of the base mat. If you can think about this being kind of a circle, if you had to array it around, but it's a 30, uh, 36 meter diameter uh, piece that would be fit in on the bottom of the actual reactor itself. Talk to you a little bit about the design change. So what we had originally was a, uh, a licensed application called Steel Bricks out of the UK, uh, which was uh, incorporated into the GE design of the reactor building. And it doesn't look so complex, but it actually is. There's quite a bit of extra work and welding that was factored into the design in terms of forming the plate, bending it, putting studs on, and putting those pieces together. And then what you have is you have quite a bit of complex welds. The red actually uh, illustrates the, uh, the welding, uh, welding lines. And so each one of these bricks is, is uh, a component of the, of the actual building. So it's, it's quite significant when you take a look at a, a reactor pressure vessel uh, and a reactor building that is, is constructed this way. The alternative was is our team took a look at a similar approach, not a whole lot different, but a lot easier to manufacture. So instead of all those welds, what we've done is we've taken a look at a DPSC, which is a diaphragm plate, uh, versus all of the welds that we have. So it's a lot simpler, it's easier to manufacture, and we're actually looking at some, uh, some, some sophisticated automation. So we remove the actual barriers to access to resources, while their qualification. But really trying to build in the nuclear quality into the process on how we produce these parts and how we supply them to site. Uh, this is a mock-up right now that we're working on in terms of the, uh, the weld cell that's, uh, that's uh, going to be fully automated. So we're in the process of ordering that and establishing a partnership strategically with a, with a customer. And these are the types of solutions that we could actually bring to Estonia to have, bring more confidence to the supply chain here, work with local partners, and really have a, a really good value proposition to support uh, Fermi's ambitions to build a few reactors. Uh, it's another, uh, another view of the, uh, the mock-ups. So you'll see some of the robots. This particular cell has four robots. Uh, we don't need a lot of welders. These robots can run 24 hours a day if we want them to. The main idea is that we just feed it full of material. 
Um, so this is the last slide, and then I think I've just got a construction video which uh, I'd like to share with you. But really what we're looking at is being able to take this type of solution and actually make it local. We can change it, we can adjust it, we can have a facility that's on-site or off-site, we can partner with local companies, and we can bring a solution that, uh, that not only assures the, uh, the product's design for G-Itachi, but also makes sure that we've got uh, reliable, a reliable process that, uh, that can feed the project. So in terms of our role and our vision, of course, our home market is Canada. Our capability and our capacity there is, is different than what it would be here in Estonia. Uh, but what we do is we have the opportunity to take those learnings from Canada for first of a kind, for four units, and be able to leverage that in different jurisdictions, whether it's in the US, whether it's in Poland, whether it's Estonia. Uh, and we're very mindful of our, our capacity and our, be able, our, our ability to be able to support. Uh, but what we do pride ourselves on partnerships. So um, what I'll do is I'll just finish up with a short video. It's uh, scaled back, so um, I'll give you a little bit of an idea in terms of the uh, the digital sequence of the construction of the uh, first BWRX at the Darlington site. So this here is the reactor building. Uh, it's the sequence of how we currently envision the, the walls and the, uh, the layers and the equipment going in, along with the reactor pressure vessel. And what you'll see on the top left-hand side is actually tied to a P6 schedule. And there's a timeline along the bottom. And up on the top, you'll see the actual progress of the days and the weeks. So right now, this is our current uh, level, uh, level three schedule, uh, which is currently being defined. I will say that this video is probably about 12 months old now. There's quite a bit of advancements. But you can see that the level of planning and detail, understanding of the technology, understanding of the construction sequencing, really helps us understand and refine what some of those challenges are, critical path, and, uh, and how we'd go about building the first unit at Darlington. And that's it. Thank you for your time. A number of decades ago, Sweden achieved the, by some metrics, the fastest build out per capita of clean energy in the history of the world, a record that has not been challenged. After several decades of not building, however, the Swedish utility Vattenfall uh, has now had to prepare for a new vision. The incoming Swedish government last year shocked the energy world by declaring a radical return to nuclear energy as the centerpiece of Sweden's energy future. The questions that Vattenfall is facing is not just about large reactors, but about SMRs. So with us today is Desiree Comstadt, Vice President for Fleet Development, who will be addressing how Vattenfall sees the questions of which SMR technology will arrive at market first and how they plan to develop it. Thank you. And I am actually going to start off a little bit wider than talking about SMR technologies and going back to the purpose that we have at Vattenfall. Because even though our government have a clear statement that we want to enable new nuclear, and we are very thankful for that, within our core, we have a purpose statement of enabling a fossil-free future within one generation. We want to help our customers and partners to decarbonize their production and their lives, basically. And we have realized in doing so that nuclear will be a very important part. 
But the transition that stands before us, we are going into this with eyes wide open. It will not be an easy transition. Sorry. Um, we see that the transi transitioning into a fossil-free future will not go unnoticed. So we have to be able to talk very closely to our stakeholders and to society that it's going to be in their backyard. We talked yesterday about the NIMBY um, statement that you can say that you don't want the transition of grid expansion or wind power or nuclear in your backyard. Well, we've actually heard that you move also away from the NIMBY uh, into a statement called BANANA. And some of you might have heard that, but BANANA stands for build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. And that's very different to go through a transition to a fossil-free future with that in mind. So I think that's very important to keep in mind. My text is different on this slide than it is up here, so that's why I'm a little bit confused sometimes. I'm sorry for that. But this is where we're at. Sweden have a little bit of a different starting point than here in Estonia. Because of the oil crisis in the 70s, we phased out most of our fossil fuels from our electricity production already. Then it was not in, with the climate in mind, it was prices were too high, basically. We couldn't afford oil and gas. So we initiated a nuclear build-out program. And we built a lot of new reactors in a very short amount of time. Something that we are thankful for today, of course, and very impressed on how you enable that. So today, we say that we have to decarbonize our industries, and we have to enable that. And in doing so, we can actually phase out 130 watt terawatt hours of oil, coal, coal and gas that we're still using within our industrial processes. And it's also a lot of money that we could stop uh, importing. It's 278 billion kroners. So, that, so that's a lot to be saved. And then you realize that we have really a competitive edge right now. We have the possibility of reaching our climate goals. We have the possibility of enabling new industries establishing themselves in Sweden. We can offer cheap, reliable and fossil-free electricity. So it, not only can we help our industries to decarbonize their existing production, we can also be the first ones to enable fossil-free steel. You all heard about hybrid, I'm guessing. We can enable fossil-free cement, fossil-free um, jet fuel, and so on. So we really want to enable all of these industries to stay in Sweden, establish themselves in Sweden, and not move somewhere else. And I realize I am out on very deep water right now. But in doing so, we have to enable wind as well. In Sweden, we, don't, we have tried very hard to move away from the either-or discussion. We realize that we are not risking building too much of something. We are risking building too little of everything. So we are working also very hard to enable a lot of wind power so that we show our industries that you can stay. We can enable this electricity for you in a, in a short amount of time. We need efficient permitting process also for wind, because they need to bridge nuclear. And we also realize that if we can't get wind up in the shorter perspective, perspective the need for additional nuclear won't be as big as we want it to be. We heard uh, earlier about the roadmap for new nuclear, something that we've looked a lot into. We are also looking at roadmaps at Vattenfall, where we realize that you will have to have a roadmap for the nation. You will have to have a roadmap showing uh, what additional capacity will we need and when, from what electricity source, that will give the planning prerequisites for the industry. Where can they establish themselves? Where can they get the grid connections that they will need? Where will they be able to get enough electricity for their production? Also, the planning prerequisites for us. How much nuclear will be needed? And where will it be needed? How much wind? So we know today we have about 50 ongoing offshore wind projects in Sweden, which means that all of the permitting authorities don't even know where to look. The, the <clears throat> resilience and, and safety perspective of that is a nightmare. So if you get the question of if you can build 50 offshore wind parks, the answer will be no. 
If you would get the question on five, maybe the answer will be yes. And there is a lot of these questions that go into nuclear as well. So I think it's for us, it's very important to have always the bigger picture in mind and making sure that we enable large scale production. So what will be required then to establish a new nuclear program? Well, you have to have the mobilization of a complete nation. You have to make sure that you have efficient permitting processes, and I will get back a little bit to that. You also have to make sure that you have long-term energy policy. It cannot be dependent on who's in government at the moment. You have to commit to the climate goals that you want to achieve, and you have to commit to the way to get there. You have to have um, a nuclear program, meaning that you have someone taking responsibility to, pr to produce all of the prerequisites that you need in order to get new nuclear going. We also see that we will have to have some sort of risk sharing with the state in order to get new nuclear in place. And political stability then, what do we mean by that? Well, you have to have the clear national ambition. I talked a little bit about that, the roadmap for a clean electricity system. That goes also for nuclear. You have to have the ambition of what we want to achieve, about how much nuclear capacity do we want and where do we want it. You also have to have a clear and stable framework in place. Uh, international experiences show that it can become very expensive if you long the pro nuclear program changed the, the framework for nuclear or for the roadmap itself. It's also very important to show suppliers that your nation is a nation that they want to have a successful project in. Because if you cannot show them that there is a stabil stable framework, there are a lot of other countries looking into nuclear at the moment. And I'm guessing that they would rather have a successful project where the uh, frameworks are stable than uh, establishing them in a country where it's volatile. Um, the Swedish government organization that we are pushing for, the Swedish nuclear program that we call it, um, is, I can see it's vastly important in order to get all of the authorities that will have to approve new nuclear aligned. We have experiences from our uh, back end and, and having the application for the final repository that it's vastly more complex today to get um, <clears throat> nuclear approved, even though it's back-end or new build, than it was when we built our existing program. And we have above 15 authorities that will all have to give the approval in order to enable a new nuclear pro uh, program. And sometimes these authorities try the same questions. So we have to make sure that these are aligned in order to get the efficient permitting processes. Also, we have to have somebody helping us, the government organization helping us to get all of the supply chains in place. And this cannot be a national uh, undertaking. It has to be a cooperation between all countries in, in Europe, I would say, who are interested in building new nuclear. Where can we cooperate in this? Because we are going to need a lot of supply chains that are not existing today. We also have to make sure that we have enough competences in place. We have to get uh, all the vocational schools, the high schools and universities in place. We have not been educating nuclear students in the majority that we have, would have wanted to during the last couple of years. We have had some <coughs> very important people who have kept the nuclear programs going. Uh, one is sitting right here. But other than that, it's been a little bit um, in the backwaters nuclear. So now we need to sort of man up again and make sure that we are um, invited into the, um, to the universities again. So what have we been doing when it comes to SMRs? We initiated a feasibility study looking into SMR technologies about a year and a half ago. Uh, and we started to look at light water reactors because that's the value chain that we have in Sweden. We know how to source the fuel and we know how to calculate that. We also know how to operate light water reactors and we can take care of the waste. And that was very important for us that we know, the, we know and we own the complete value chain of that. We are also very familiar with that technology. 
So during the year, we have looked at uh, one of our existing nuclear sites in Sweden uh, because we, are, we know that it's a very good site. We have the, the local stakeholder um, commitment there. We have competence in the area. We have the logistics chains. We have uh, the grid connection and so on. So it's a good site for new nuclear. And we sort of realized that if we can't make it happen at Ringhals, it will be very difficult to build new nuclear anywhere else in Sweden. So we have looked at the timeline. What has to happen and when if we want new nuclear? And back to the roadmap again. When do we want it? When do we need it? And what has to happen if we backtrack from that? We have looked at a lot of suppliers. Uh, we have done a vendor selection, a down selection. It's still ongoing. Uh, talking a lot to the offers, trying to understand the delivery models that are being offered, trying to understand the modularity, what will it mean, how the supply chains have to be built up, and so on. SMRs is, I'm very sure they will happen. Sometimes you meet that it's, there aren't any production today. Well, that's just a matter of time. However, we need to cooperate a lot, all of the countries that are interested. We need to together also make sure that in European scale, we can make it happen. Uh, we have also looked at the site itself, making sure that we are ready to hand in the application to the environmental and uh, court and so on. Uh, we have also bought land and, and um, made sure that we are um, looking at the financing of this project, what sort of investments would we need. And we have also kept our close cooperation with Fermi, something that we are very proud of. We came in connection with Fermi Nergia very early on, and by that time, we wanted to learn more about the SMR technique because we realized that this could be something for us. After that, we have accelerated our new build program in Sweden, and we have learned so much from being a part of Fermi, and we have had a lot of cooperation during these years as well. We have shared a lot of know-how and best practices. We have also made sure that we share the technical studies that we have been doing on, on the possibilities of SMRs. We have <coughs> also looked at training and competence. How can we work together on that? And we see that we have a lot of areas where we can keep and cooperating and cooperate uh, closer, such as training and, and fuel and the value chains that I talked about that we have at Vattenfall. How can that come from Energia to, uh, to gain? And I want to end with this, because this, I think, is one of our greatest challenges when it comes to enabling the fossil-free future all the climate heroes that will be needed. In Sweden, we are talking about an abundance of engineers, and there are a lot of exciting projects out there, not only the projects at Vattenfall, but within the total energy sector. And I think that we have to start thinking outside of the box in order to find all of these talented people that will need to be a part of this journey. And one of that, that outside of the box is to cooperate a lot more between countries. But I think it's absolutely doable. Thank you. Thank you. Eesti Vabariigi valitsus. The government of Estonia created in 2020 a working group of uh, nuclear energy. And this working group was trying to find out what the needs uh, um, of Estonia are. Uh, f uh, about nuclear energy. And also the International Autumn Energy Agency controlled uh, the activities of this working group. And now the report is ready. And the uh, um, conclusion of this work is yes. But Ainti Doming, uh, Deputy Secretary General, uh, of uh, the uh, Ministry of Climate will talk more about it. Hello, and uh, I would like to thank Fermi Energy for inviting me to this event, because this will definitely uh, help uh, uh, us Estonians to raise awareness about uh, nuclear energy. I would like to give an overview over what uh, this working group was dealing with during uh, two and uh, a half years and what the results were. My name is Ainti Doming. Uh, I was also the chairman of Nuclear Energy Working Group. When uh, we started to work on this, we 
proceeded from the mandate that the government of Estonia gave us to answer two questions, whether it's possible to uh, implement um, um, uh, nuclear energy and under which circumstances. And we certainly also carried out this study according to the guidelines of IAEA. And then uh, we involved also uh, experts. We um, purchased uh, different uh, expert opinion and our working group assessed uh, these uh, um, uh, expert points of views. So uh, this uh, report, in other words, consists of knowledge-based info, uh, uh, information. And last uh, autumn, uh, integrated nuclear uh, infrastructure review was also carried out. Uh, and uh, they assessed whether we should move on with the nuclear program or not. But as Kadri said in the introduction, uh, the general conclusion was yes, but only uh, considering certain uh, circumstances. And definitely it will not happen uh, overnight. It requires thorough planning. Uh, in order to move on uh, with implementing this uh, energy source. And uh, the general basis consists of both political will as well as general uh, support of general audience. We also uh, draw a conclusion uh, that there are several positive aspects in implementing uh, this uh, energy source, for example, leaching our climate goals and uh, guaranteeing also security of supply. But at the same time, it's a long-term obligation for uh, the country and uh, it has to be uh, uh, thoroughly thought through. Now, talking about the time frame, um, our assessment of the working group was that in ideal circumstances, it will all take nine to 11 years if uh, the private sector as well as, as the public sector uh, would uh, work efficiently. But as the minister mentioned, it can also take more time. Now, talking about uh, technology, Estonia is neutral as to technology. We are not uh, selecting uh, the technology or the producer right now. This is a part of the later process. First, we have to uh, decide uh, where uh, it will be uh, placed, and then the uh, regulator will also uh, define uh, the circumstances. And um, our priority has different, definitely been safety, how to guarantee safety, how to um, uh, um, put it into the grid system, and how the technologies will fit in uh, into uh, the existing system. Now, talking uh, about uh, the uh, location, whether it's possible to uh, um, construct a nuclear power plant in Estonia at all, we uh, carried out this preliminary study whether the uh, uh, natural environment will be suitable, whether there will be enough uh, cooling, uh, water, etc., etc. We learned that there are all in all 16 uh, um, potential locations, but uh, in four locations, there were uh, um, recommendations given as uh, there are both uh, social and economic uh, um, positive results as Varbla, Loksa, uh, Kunda, and Toila areas were recommended as most. Uh, but this is uh, not uh, a choice yet. This is just uh, background information. And uh, we will uh, make up our minds as a result uh, of a national special planning process. Now, uh, another topic uh, of um, concern is also how to work with uh, radioactive uh, waste. Uh, and we carried out also very thorough work 
and the uh, Atomic Energy Agency also painted it out. We calculated how much uh, uh, waste would be created, uh, and it would be uh, over one uh, uh, year, like uh, about uh, three containers, and how this should be handled is uh, uh, geological, um, um, bearing uh, disposal. And we know that uh, the um, um, technology is uh, changing uh, all of the time, and there might be also uh, other uh, uh, solutions as reprocessing, etc. And then the principle of the polluter pays. And uh, based on that, we will also um, take a decision about where disposal can be carried out and how. And now, once we uh, will receive a mandate to continue with this process, it is very important also to create a regulator for uh, the state. So what kind of a regulator it would be, where it would be uh, placed, and uh, uh, there is uh, um, environmental agency that already uh, has a safety um, um, department. But we definitely will uh, have to um, continue working on uh, this. And also, we need to elaborate a legal act on uh, nuclear energy. Now, from the point of view of uh, the Estonian government, if we decide to move further, uh, the whole period of 9 to 11 years, we uh, would need about uh, 73 millions for creating uh, uh, regulator and legislation, but definitely uh, all so we need to create the uh, capacity uh, capacity of rescue. So uh, there are also constant costs about 2.5 million, etc., etc. A part of this, uh, uh, these discussions has also been uh, whether it's a plus or a minus project for nationally. Well, definitely uh, in the initial process when we are creating the framework, then uh, uh, it will be on the minor side, but when the construction works uh, will uh, start, then uh, it will change. And uh, according to the assessments uh, known, uh, the uh, plus uh, sites uh, um, based on taxes only will be about uh, uh, 90 million euros. But there are indirect uh, 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 incomes also that we haven't calculated yet. Now, uh, um, uh, the uh, open uh, debate, public uh, debate and political uh, debate has already started in the beginning of this uh, year, which is very positive in order to raise awareness. And it's very important to be fact-based and knowledge-based uh, in these uh, discussions. But still, the choice whether to, to move on or not will uh, be made by the Estonian parliament and if we will receive the positive mandate from the parliament, then the next steps will be creating a regulator, the legislation also defined the location through special planning processes. And finally, I would also like to stress that the role of our working group was uh, to offer the best knowledge based on this report in order to make up uh, our minds based on facts, also uh, uh, to decide whether nuclear energy would have um, a positive role in Estonia long term, and uh, if there will be a positive uh, 
uh, outcome, uh, a positive decision, we can uh, move uh, further. And I would also like to underline that uh, finalizing this uh, report was uh, really uh, um, uh, long-term work. I would like to uh, thank Meris Munt, uh, the previous leader of uh, the project, Ilmar Puskar, uh, Meelika Runnel, and uh, Timo Tatar and his uh, team. Uh, and uh, I would uh, especially like to uh, underline that there were practically all ministries of Estonia, uh, with the exception of uh, the Ministry of Culture participating in this working group. And also the different boards were involved, and the Minister of Interior, as well as the Minister of Regions, who were assessing also uh, different aspects of the project. Thank you very much. I speak about nuclear energy around the world, and one of the top things people point out, top things energy experts themselves point out, is that nuclear is very expensive. Certainly, if you look at the cost of nuclear plants, the numbers are big, the zeros are long, it's very intimidating. God bless you, Caleb, you're very brave. But that leads us to something very strange. I myself live in Chicago with 80% nuclear electricity and cheaper electricity than I believe all of you have. So it leads us to this paradox where nuclear energy appears to be an expensive way to make cheap power, and renewables seem to be a cheap way to make expensive power. Uh, how can this be? Well, it turns out that system costs are very important, and it turns out that being able to deliver energy that your customers want, where and when they want it, is of the highest importance. A question that I think Estonians may have is, if you build this beautiful, grand, world-leading project, will the individual household actually see some of this cheap nuclear power? Uh, to explain more, we have Ermas Voigt, Fermi Energia Sales Director and Business Development Manager for large customers, who will explain Fermi's approach to finding agreements between customers and Fermi that will provide power should this project proceed on time and on budget at costs that are actually lower than today. Armas? There is no world come. Good morning. My background is the following. For 10 to 15 years, I have been uh, advising large enterprises on electricity uh, contracts. And I'm going to speak, in, speak about uh, uh, supply chains. And uh, let me tell you a secret. I've heard uh, that what ChatGPT tells about certain things. And I asked a specific question, and I did not get an answer to this. So I'm coming back to this. What ChatGPT does not know? But first, I'll share you a, a story with a number two uh, industrial business in Estonia. In 2020, this company decided to enter into a power purchase agreement with a big uh, Nordic uh, um, company, and it was four euros uh, for and something for uh, one month. That was July 2020. After this, uh, after this month, actually, in the Nordic countries, the power or electricity price was two euros and 20 cents. So that is why I'm speaking about this. Where does the competitiveness come? This was just one month and the, behind the secret, we had the hydropower from Nordic countries. And after that, I called a friend that is working in Norway and I asked about him about the actual hydro, hydropower. Um, to be able to sell this uh, during whole, a whole month, then the capacity should be lower. And uh, he actually said it was one hour and 30 cents. And this was the answer that the chat GPT could not tell me. So in the southern areas of Norway, the uh, electricity cost during that month one euro and just a few cents. But there are two simple questions for the consumers. 
And is there electricity or not? And the answer is yes. And the second question is, what does it cost? And then we come to this issue that electricity has to be sustainable and environmentally friendly. It cannot be cheap and dirty. And the question is, who tells us what the electricity price is? Where does this electricity price come from? I'm, I put here uh, where electricity comes from, actually. Uh, we know that our electricity comes from Finland, but actually it does not come from Finland, but from Sweden and Norway, just via Finland. Uh, they take what they need and then forward this uh, to the Baltic countries. And then we also have a cable coming to uh, Lithuania that comes directly from Sweden. So this is the picture. Uh, so who owns the electricity before we start using it? And how does the price uh, develop in Nordic countries? I told you that it could be very low, but it is not clearly sustainable. Uh, it was just the moment of competitiveness uh, at, at that point. But there is an agreement in the Nordic countries. They establish the whole price in the Nordic countries. Then they take into account the cables through which uh, electricity can be sold. For example, Norway is selling to the UK, Germany, and France. Uh, Sweden is selling to Germany, Poland, and Lithuania. So. These countries are the net consumers of the Nordic system. So the cable that comes from Finland to Estonia, uh, this is important for us. So I put up here the electricity prices for the past four years, and you can see <coughs> the average price in Nordic countries was 10 euros and 90 cents. And after that, they establish how much in one or the other country, the electricity price should differ from the wholesale price of the Nordic countries. So you can clearly see uh, that those, the countries whose electricity price is lower than the average Nordic. And you could see that last year, uh, Finland reached zero for the first time. And that means uh, uh, behind this is the installed uh, capacity of Olkiluoto or third reactor and um, the um, wind farms. I think this is what we should nudge closer uh, as Estonia so that we wouldn't be in a place where Denmark and the other Baltic countries are. But we have to admit that solving our problem, we also take along the other Baltic countries because we have sufficient cable connections between our countries. And um, I'll show you now how to end up in the uh, same group of countries when it comes to energy prices. Let's look at what they are using for generating electri electricity. Norway, hydropower. This is figures from 2022. Uh, uh, and they come from the All World Energy Data Mix page. <clears throat> uh, the cheapest variable uh, cost in Norway. In Sweden, uh, we have water, wind, and nuclear energy. In Finland and Denmark, in Finland, the choice of technology is much broader. Obviously, they've been using a lot of the timber industry for biomass, and that is why the biomass uh, share is high because they need energy for the, uh, uh, in the, uh, for the production process, and they have uh, uh, waste left over. But we can also see that the nuclear share is high, and also the hydropower has uh, important sh an important share. Then we look at Denmark. Denmark has always been an important uh, wind farm uh, developer, and they have built a uh, they have believed in this uh, and invested into this a lot. But, and, but we can see now for the first time why I also added uh, uh, oil shale and coal in one uh, column here. The higher the share in the last uh, column, the, most, the, the more difficult it is to get reasonable prices. And as the time moves on, even if you uh, reduce its share, its cost increase, increases through environmental charges. So in Denmark, so this is shown in Denmark, but the electricity price that you have to 
add to the Nordic average is quite high. And even 2022, the year of crisis, it was higher than what we had here in Estonia. And the reason is that they just remained between the Nordic countries and the continental Europe, and all the gas prices that developed in uh, Europe uh, affected them a lot because they have direct contacts between uh, the Netherlands and Germany. And then we look at the Baltic states. So here we have our work laid out for us. We have to reduce reduce uh, generation of electricity from gas and oil shale and increase the share of other sources. But we still have this path ahead of us. We can make choices as to the direction. So we can see that Denmark is quite different from uh, the other three Nordic countries. And Finland was in the same boat uh, earlier, but not anymore with Denmark, because we can see that after Olkiluoto launch, the share of uh, nuclear is uh, uh, more than 40 percent. And when we uh, ask why uh, we cannot see uh, the figures for wind, uh, because uh, wind was only 7 percent last year, uh, that was because the prices were high and oil shale was also competitive. Uh, but we know from uh, uh, the uh, recent news that the fossil fuel uh, energy share in Estonia was less than half already. And one part of the debate as regards nuclear energy is that we will have a connection with Finland. And Finland has been able to solve their challenges quite um, reasonably. So S-Link 3. Why shouldn't we have a nuclear power plant where experience is uh, greater? Finland. Let's put a cable there and build a nuclear power plant in Finland and participate in that project in some way. But we can see that it is not important whether Estonians are part of it or not, whether, whether it is uh, uh, nuclear or wind or what not, what the Finns are developing. The cable becomes uh, not a problem but a bottleneck. We have already planned Estlink 3. And according to different uh, um, uh, for forecasts, uh, there's different uh, uh, completion times. Uh, Ellering uh, uh, has said that it is not earlier than 2035. Um, some um, sources say that it is 2033. And Lotvenerko thinks that this is completed by uh, 2031. So the Latvians think that uh, believe in us more than we ourselves believe in this. Uh, so uh, Estonians, when they are looking at um, the Finns, then uh, they want to achieve this sooner, but eventually it will be uh, completed. I looked at the um, load factor for Estlink 1 and 2 last year, and it was 79%. And uh, so what was this potential? So it was 79%. Uh, that was used for uh, supplying energy to the Baltic countries. And the Estlink 3, if this has the same uh, uh, load factor, then you can see this is 4.8 terawatt hours. But by the time the energy consumption in Baltic countries has increased more, so we heard already problems that can happen to the cables. It can break down, and we actually don't know when Estlink uh, uh, will be fixed. Yeah, they are saying that probably it won't be fixed during uh, the month of February. So we don't know, actually. And we can see that this is the cable through which we get our energy. And we will only start seeing the problems that are related to the cables. Uh, it is uh, minus 5 today, but uh, ne uh, by the end of the week, we'll have minus 15, minus 20. This is when we see the problems. The cable is definitely necessary, but it does not solve our current situation. It brings back us to a situation where we are once we complete the new cable as well. And I also put up here this slide. For some reason, our people believe in, ourself, in us more than actually than some of our uh, uh, greatest minds who are telling that we won't be able to do this, we've never done it, we have no people, we are not so rich, and so on and so forth. Actually, 
uh, we have quite a lot of nuclear energy around us. When Slovakia can do it, why can't we do it? When the Czechs can do it, why we can't do it? Uh, can we hear uh, uh, something from the Polish uh, plans uh, in one presentation today? But Poland has uh, a national plan already with three state uh, or three companies where the state has a share. And all these three companies are planning nuclear energy. And Poland is a large country. They have different niches where they want to operate uh, their nuclear projects. So if uh, uh, Poland also joins the nuclear, then the Baltic countries will remain uh, in a very poor situation. <clears throat> and uh, Norway has a great uh, capacity for uh, hydropower. So when all the other countries will manage, why can't we? And I think we have a, when we look, when you come to the, our website, you can see there is a place where um, uh, companies have, can enter with us into um, memorandum of understanding so that they could enter into contracts with us for new uh, nuclear energy. This is just my marketing um, slogan here. But uh, when we heard that uh, last year's price uh, of electricity was 90 euros, then definitely uh, our price will be by 20% lower than that. And we are not even, even thinking about inflation once it, the plant is uh, completed in 20, uh, 31, 35 or whatnot. So thank you uh, on my behalf, and I will give the floor to the next speaker. So both uh, Fermi Energia and uh, Estonia uh, as a country have carried out initial uh, studies for uh, uh, finding out where the potential location uh, site would be. Of course, uh, there are very uh, um, strict requirements for that. But how would a nuclear power plant affect people living in the area? Uh, in order to find out this, I would like to invite uh, two local politicians, uh, Einar Valbaun, who is mayor of Viru Nikula municipality, and uh, Lykonus, uh, from Lykonus uh, municipality, Dmitri Dmitri, chairman of the municipal council. And uh, I would like to ask you first, uh, what is your uh, opinion, uh, indifferently, of whether the uh, power plant will be placed in Virunikola or um, Lykonos, uh, whether it will be beneficial to Estonia. Yes, my point of view is that it will uh, be beneficial, and every mayor uh, is probably dreaming about uh, the location in his or her municipality because this uh, means uh, also uh, workplaces. We don't know whether there will be a nuclear power plant or not, because we are waiting for a decision uh, from the parliament. And uh, we uh, will uh, probably be competing um, about the location if there will be a, a positive uh, decision. And uh, one uh, of uh, the problems that might occur for Estonia is also uh, the high uh, price of electricity if uh, we are not delivered from our neighboring country uh, sufficient amounts of energy. And uh, we uh, definitely need 
to solve uh, these problems that are definitely on uh, to be solved on a higher level than local uh, governments. But uh, it will be an interesting effect, both socially and economically, for Estonia. And recently, a study was carried out by Kantar Emor company, and 69% of respondents said that they would support nuclear energy. And as far as I can understand, you're also positive towards nuclear energy. Yes, of course, I have visited nuclear power plants in both Finland and Sweden. And uh, I know what they look like. And uh, talking about Chernobyl, for example, we uh, know what happened there. And uh, if we look uh, at the eastern part of Estonia, where both of my municipalities are situated, we know that uh, on the other side of Gulf of Finland, in Finland, there is a nuclear power plant. On the other side of the Russian border, there is also a nuclear power plant. And uh, definitely, we would manage and be able uh, to uh, um, yeah, operate uh, also a nuclear power plant. We have also seen other big projects uh, in um, in uh, our area. For example, the harbor of uh, Kunda. Uh, they were um, not happy with this big project originally, uh, and they were complaining uh, about uh, the nature disappearing, also animals disappearing. But that did not happen. But uh, And we also have to ask, uh, where does money come from? It doesn't come uh, from uh, ATMs. But uh, if some people state that uh, we can buy it from Finland, shall we buy everything else also from uh, Finland? And uh, shall we uh, only... Uh, mm, be living uh, on what the nature gives us. For me, it's hard to add anything. The main question for me is uh, to preserve uh, the uh, competition capacity in uh, our region, in the eastern uh, part of Estonia. And looking at economic prognosis, we know that there is not anything very positive um, expecting us ahead. Uh, and uh, for giving some hope to investors and to preserve also the uh, working places in the industrial area as we are in eastern uh, uh, Viru County as well as Lana Viru County. I think that awareness uh, has also risen among Estonians and maybe one of the reasons why, for why support has increased is also the f uh, fact that people need to pay their bills. And uh, what would you say? Have you also noticed that general level of knowledge about energy questions has risen? I would say that the ones who are interested they definitely have had opportunities to learn more. We have been on study visits in Finland. There is a lot of literature that has been published about nuclear uh, uh, energy. And um, from both of our municipalities, people have uh, been visiting nuclear power plants. And people who uh, are sales uh, people uh, who show how things uh, work, uh, they, um, that's their task to describe how it all looks like. I can recall uh, <laughs> that uh, when my grandmother still was alive and when a natural gas stove was delivered to her home, for many, many years ago, she moved out from her apartment and uh, didn't come back for two uh, weeks. But uh, that can be a, a parallel example of what things look uh, like now. Uh, were you also uh, following uh, carefully uh, the uh, process uh, of finding out the potential uh, location? of uh, 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 
nuclear power plant. And did you talk to locals? Yes, definitely. We uh, did. We were also talking to people uh, who are working for the municipality. Um, and we uh, were describing what the situation is uh, in uh, Finland and in Sweden, how many work opportunities were added, etc., etc. And uh, um, there is also a big difference uh, of uh, local taxes coming to the budget of uh, local uh, municipalities. And uh, um, I would say that looking at, at the broader picture for Estonia, uh, this uh, huge development needs to be carried out. And uh, on one hand, this uh, will uh, affect uh, the uh, energy supply. But I would also say that uh, Fermi Energy has uh, shown really good results in uh, forwarding information, uh, uh, talking to local people. Uh, we have also received answers to our questions. And um, of course, uh, locals ask questions about safety, uh, what the risks are, but uh, we uh, also can describe what the positive outcome can uh, be, both on the national level as well as on uh, the local level of uh, economies regionally. So what would you say? Uh, uh, let's presume that the parliament decides uh, to proceed with this project. Uh, what would your expectations be? I would say that let's first wait and see uh, what the decision will be. There is no need to um, make uh, any preliminary uh, decisions. Uh, but, um, uh, for example, I'm going to have a meeting with local people in three days with uh, Kunda people. And uh, uh, this um, will be a, a meeting uh, on totally different local questions. But people are asking me already now, how much are they dragging out this process in uh, Tallinn? Why uh, the, is there no decision uh, yet about the nuclear power plant? And uh, um, we would like to further develop also the industrial enterprises in our region, because if we don't have industries, we will not be able to pay salaries for teachers as well. And everybody cannot move to Finland to work and earn there. And therefore, I really have high expectations on the Estonian parliament uh, to take uh, a positive uh, uh, decision on this uh, question. And of course, parliament consists of uh, smart people as well. I, as a representative of Idavero County, uh, would also like to mention uh, that uh, um, I would like to see a little bit uh, different attitude from the national uh, level uh, because uh, uh, there's too little, uh, there are too little resources who, that are coming uh, to the mining and engineering areas of uh, Estonia. And if there will be a special planning process, uh, in on the national uh, level, uh, I think that uh, these uh, uh, regions, areas should be considered more. Uh, and the uh, location of uh, uh, nuclear uh, power plant uh, should consider more the local governments. Because uh, when uh, mining um, um, the uh, um, uh, oil shale, there were no uh, big results of this for eastern part of Estonia. In Finland and in Sweden, it has occurred also 
that if local governments are very interested in uh, bringing the uh, <clears throat> uh, bringing the uh, uh, nuclear power plant to its uh, municipality, they cooperate somehow. Yes, we will definitely continue our cooperation uh, in the future as well. And if uh, it will come to Kunda area, we can uh, also um, take an, uh, as an example Kunda cell. Uh, because they work with uh, all neighboring uh, municipalities, and it's always nice to have strong and well-off uh, neighbors. And uh, I'm sure that we are not talking about uh, uh, a site that uh, is important only for one municipality, not at all. It is uh, of great importance to uh, the whole of Estonia, and it's also a question of uh, energy uh, safety and uh, the whole process uh, of uh, finding out, out the right uh, location, uh, let it be Viru Nikula or any other location, uh, we will not be able to uh, affect it ourselves. Now, you personally, what inspired you uh, in the question of nuclear economy? I know that uh, an uh, acquaintance of mine who also lives in uh, your area said that uh, uh, when uh, she was a little girl, she was not able to wear pink clothes because the air was so polluted that her clothing became dirty immediately. There were very big environmental problems in the area. Yes, it's true. And uh, it has made us in a way also stronger to continue with entrepreneurship. And uh, it was not uh, the um, situation uh, only in Kunta area, in, uh, um, in uh, Kotlerva area, there were also huge environmental problems. And there is a local museum in uh, Kunta area, uh, and I would recommend to visit the local museum where you can see how the situation was. But as a patriot, of Eastern Estonia, I would say that if there are no industrial enterprises, uh, if there is no industry, there is no culture, there is nothing else. And we can be as green uh, as uh, possible, but one day um, we uh, will be starving if there will not be any income for us. So, um, I think uh, this is a good opportunity, a good solution that could really work uh, in the case of Estonia. And the question is, we are speaking about electricity, but from the local point, government point of view, we take look at the broader picture, whether it works also for district heating, whether it works for providing livelihoods to our uh, people, so it is a broader picture b issue for us. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned real estate. Uh, the, the, our real estate prices are going back to uh, zero, but it happened uh, the other way around in Finland. When around the nuclear power plant, the uh, real estate prices went up. So industry has an influence on real estate prices as well. Thank you for this discussion, and now I can tell you that we have the lunch break and af uh, and after today please come visit K uh, Kunda and come to our museum where we have the atomic room Thank you everyone for your Welcome back Let's continue with our program like Estonia Poland is also suffering from um, high um, carbon emissions and pollution. Both Estonia and Poland are like the black sheep of the European electrical 
markets. But Poland has already decided to improve the situation and do this fast. And uh, Poland has been moving a lot faster on the green energy landscape than Estonia. Started developing also both renewable and nuclear energy. And they are looking into conventional large reactors and also small modular reactors. And we have uh, we have Václav Kudovsky speaking about BWRX 300 from Orland Center of Green Energy. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Please come back because you will miss interesting presentation. <laughs> uh, actually, this presentation should be given by our CEO, Rafał Kasprov, but I am the guy who is always backupping. If something happens, I'm always, you know, on standby. Uh, officially, I am advisor to the, to the Orlen Sintos Green Energy, responsible for the nuclear strategy. So I'm very much a part of the BWRX uh, development or deployment project. Moreover, I'm also a professor at the National Center of Nuclear Research when I'm working in research with the high temperature gas cooled reactor. But that's a different story. My main message I heard that there will be a lot of uh, parliament members. My main message of today is impossible is nothing. So if you want to do things, do it, because it's possible. <laughs> you know, on our road to the SMR fleet deployment, we were, in a way, a little bit together with the Fermi Energia, the wave breaker. The owner of Sintos, Mr. Solovov was the first person in Europe who said, why nuclear must be a monopoly of the state? Let's sign an agreement with GE Hitachi and let's try to do it. And why SMR? You know the lower, lower threshold for the investment, lower risks. But also, you know, students ask me, Václav, which SMR is the best one? The answer is very simple. The one which fits to the requirements of the customer and has the sufficient technology development level. So the good thing which we never hear about SMR is that they can be tailored for the needs of the customer, in big difference to the big nuclear, which must be, you have to accept what is done already. Not talking that the main, main designer of the BWRX is my former student from Royal Institute of Technology, Christel Dahlgren. It's always a pleasure also to be here because I see a lot of my former students, both from Sweden and Estonia, coming for, this, for these conferences. So in year 2019 and 2020, there was an agreement signed where the first Polish entity said, we would like to build on our condition the nuclear power in Poland. The reason was very simple. That is also the message which should go back to the decision makers. You know, we are talking quite a lot with the municipalities, with the people responsible for the development of municipalities. If any investor comes to invest for some industrial facilities, now, the first question is about taxes, the second is about the carbon footprint. If we will not have energy sources with the low carbon footprint, we will probably not be able in the future to compete with our products on the international market. And that was the main driver for the Sintos owner, which is actually mainly the chemical, the chemical company. Without, and people would like not only drive an electrical car, they would like to drive on the green tires and the green equipment inside. So the main driver is really not to rely on the slow development of big nuclear power, but try to get things in our own hands. So the first was agreement, as I said, with the, with the GE Hitachi. Then actually 2022, Orlen joined the company. And we have, in a way, a dream situation. You know, I was working a lot of with DOE. DOE is ready, you know, to fund 95% of some projects to reach in 10 years, maybe 50-50, you know, private, public. Here, at the very beginning, we got Orlen being under the state, state supervision. We had a dream solution, you know. 
public-private alliance to build a new nuclear. So we did a lot of due diligences on different, on different technologies, and finally the choice was BWRX. I will tell you why. One of the very important events which happened 2023 is a technology collaboration agreement signed by GE Hitachi, Tennessee Valley Authority, OPG, and OSG, actually to work on the standard design. We would like to have a dream with SMR, you know, like the aviation has, you know, one plane which can be flying, you know, to every country. But I ask that question, senior people. I mean, too late. It's impossible. But you can do as much as possible because, you know, the finally nuclear safety is a national responsibility. But there is a lot of things to do. You can do the standard design, the design of the reactor, which would fit most of the regulation, common regulation of the country, of the customer. And then we work quite a lot with the regulator to do the cooperation on the assessment. So we are very happy that Polish regulator signed the joint assessment agreement with Canadian regulator, with American regulator. Now they join also the activity on this European market having this early joint assessment of the European SMR solution. So there is a lot of things which are going on. So nuclear must not be that expensive as it is. Few words about Synthos, as I told you, one of the biggest chemical companies having also very differentiated industrial profile. And Orlen is a petrochemical giant. The driver for the Orlen is the same. They have to think about the future beyond the fossil fuel. So they do it in a very broad way. They do renewables, but they decided actually to join efforts with Synthos Green Energy, create all in Synthos Green Energy, and to work solely on the nuclear deployment in Poland. Our goal is Poland is heavily dependent on the burning of the fossil fuels. The energy in Poland must be changed to replace. As I said, there is, I'm saying that the time of the cheap products is over. The customer will be ready to pay more to have better conscience and to leave the lower carbon footprint. So I'm saying that a lot of industry people understand that, that the only way to compete on the international market with the different projects. Actually, it's also valid for agriculture. I was surprised how much the carbon footprint is left on the agricultural products. So for the countries like Poland, Estonia, which are living very much on the, on the export, to have access to the low carbon footprint of the energy is the first step to do, because it will follow all the products way. We have one of the highest footprint in the en energy. We have about, about s almost one ton over the megawatt hour produced in Poland, the footprint. So there is a deep understanding that without emission-free energy, there will be no future for the, for the industry. The energy market is, as well, you saw this. Today, we have, as you say, hard coal is 45%, lignite or brown coal, as we go, 27. We have a growing, we have a growing uh, renewable part. Last year, it was 21%, uh, but Renewables are not controllable. It's not the base load for the, for the grid. And I hear on many, many conferences, people coming from the grid with all the discussions about the future of energy, people are neglecting the grid requirements. So you will see that our strategy to deploy, to deploy the BWRX is also very much with respect to the requirements of this grid stability. In 2050, we would like to hear to have, to have totally emission-free. This is an ambition of the whole Europe. So if we look, you know, it's a very complicated. It, this is an analysis done uh, by um, PNC uh, for, on our request, Polish nuclear power program. So you will see that the black one 
are the coal-fired, which are just aging. You know, this is not a problem only of the, of the uh, climate concern. You know, I visited a few months ago the big power thermal power plant of Veolia in, in Poland. They showed me very proudly all the facilities. It's from 70s. I said, welcome to the communist time. And you know, main, main uh, activity of the engineers is actually to prolong the lifetime of many components which are actually living three times over the design lifetime. And that's the majority of the Polish power plants. So this black one has to be has to be taken out of the, of the uh, grid. Uh, so new, new, there is no money and no intention to go, you know, there is some political, uh, oh, we have still coal. But as I said, if we will use coal in the future, we will not sell, maybe we can warm our houses, but we will not sell any product on the international market. So this equation is extremely simple. There is nothing to, to, to hide. So that is a strategy, which is, a, which is Polish uh, energy program 2045 will be updated very much based on this, on this, on this data. And you will see the projection, you know, we, we, ha we are today of about the same, being four times more populated country, we, are, we have almost the same, the same energy production as Sweden, about 170 terawatt hours, 80% of that based on the fossil fossil fuel, and this is our projection how the consumption will grow. Everybody knows also that the development or human development index is very strongly correlated with the energy consumption. We can save some energy, but the energy grow will be something from 100, 170 terawatt hours today to about 240 terawatt hours. And at the same time, we have to eliminate all the coal fired. The black part here, actually, this is the, that's the first assessment, by the way, of the hydrogen. Hydrogen economy is called hydrogen transformation. It is very much, I would say, overemphasized on the political level, but the truth is that it has its own virtues but it is very, very badly overemphasized on the political level. Everybody believes that the hydrogen will solve the problem. Hydrogen will not solve all the problems. There will be a contribution to it. This is the first, actually, assessment showing also high hydrogen economy. For the Swedish situation, it was never mentioned, but if you want, for example, go to the, to the uh, carbon-free steel production, the energy consumption will e increase by the factor of three. So whatever you touch, whatever you touch, there will be, if you want to produce cleaner products, you will also intensify the use of the electricity. There is no other way. So this is one of the first assessments showing also the impact of the, of the, of the hydrogen. The gray one is a power consumption of the, of, of the household. The another, problem aside of the electricity is actually heating. 82% of the heating energy is produced by the fossil, 72 by coal, 82% of the fossil, fossil fuels. There is a bad message and a lot of bad air. Actually, we have about 40 to 50,000 little cases based, I mean, originated from the pollution of the air mainly originated from the, from the heating sector, between 40 and 50,000. Actually, we are leading this list just behind Turkey. But there was a bad news. But the good news, Poland is the very well-piped country. 16 million people are actually uh, connected to the, to the heat pipes, almost half of the Poland. So we see, and we have thousands, we have 50, 55, 55 terawatt hours actually installed capacity per year, and we have about 400, 400 entities producing heat for the district heating. So it's a very and again we have to we have to uh, get rid of this coal and lignite uh, sources. 
as you see, Poland is actually the best pipe. You have 16 million people. So it's actually a perfect situation for getting few reactors to come. Uh, what we'll do with another, another 16 million people, actually, we strongly believe that will be electricity plus heat pumps. That would be a solution to get rid of the of the polluting polluting sources and gas of course because of the by the way also for the one should listen to the expert i remember 2008 i was on the conference on the energy security in norway and the title of my presentation was if you think energy security think pipes not nukes it turned out to be so true, by the way, and I was, I was actually appealing that not to sign the Nord Stream 2 agreement, it was signed a few months later after that. But if it would be wiser, then we wouldn't do that. So, so, uh, this is, so we did actually nice assessment which technology could answer the following question. Possibility of obtaining financing, we know the international funding market, potential of large-scale implementation, following Polish needs, which build the highest 2000, between 2030 and 2040. Stability, availability of production control, it means to be the base load. And the final assessment is showing actually that only gas and SMRs, BWRX, that also appeal to the political people. I mean, SMR is a name like a car. So unless you tell which SMR you mean, you don't know what you are talking about. There is about 82 projects now in the world which are called SMR. The most important next information after SMR is a power level and modularity. But the next information you have to deliver talking about what technology you are using, what cooling technology. If you are talking light water based SMR or you are talking very advanced, you know, heavy metal cooled because there is a different maturity of the, of the technology development. And, but you see, when, when you do that, we have gas is excluded of political reason, but also of the price reason. Don't forget that in the, all the analysis which we do, the cost of the fuel in the OPEX is about 10 or less percent. Actually, today, for existing, it's less than 5%, by the way, of the OPEX, but for the future, is maximum 10% of the operational cost is actually fuel, fuel cost. So that's a very important thing. That's a forest uh, forecast capacity gap in Polish energy system. Just following, following this uh, shutting down of the. So you see that by the year 2040, we will have a power gap of 14 gigawatt. So when you heard, you know, kind of the some of this, you know, CEO of the big energy company, they had very big pressure on the media, you know, saying about the fleet or 80, 70, whatever. But if you look at that number, and if you are serious, if you want to cover 14 gigawatt of the gap, unavoidable gap, and if you are looking at BWRX, so that's not a very big equation to say that you will need about 50 such a reactors. So we are talking about the fleet of covering the power gap of about 14 by year 2040. And this is independently, by the way, of the big nuclear. If the big nuclear will be ready really by year 2035-34, it will not change. So this is a gap aside of the, of the big nuclear. So big nuclear will solve part of the problem, but will not solve all the problems. KPMG did a very nice analysis for that. This is benefits from the BWR in the 60 year. Don't forget the design time of this reactor today is 60 years. Probably the exploitation time will be 80 years. Today's reactors in operation, there were planned, designed for 30 years. Most of them are actually reaching 50 years of the existing reactor uh, deployed in the 70s and 80s. So, you have a nice, nice summary here. Compared to the, to the coal-fired, we are actually saving 175 million tons with one BWRX in the... We are saving so many tons of the sulfur and <coughs> nitrogen oxide and this particle, particulate matter. 2.5 is actually the biggest killer in the, in the 65 millions of tons of coals. And by the way, counting the transportation of coal in Poland is about, yes, yes. I'm. 
So the road to a fleet of the BWRX in Poland, you know, we are already in two years, we actually grew from few people to above 70. Actually, today we are almost 80 people. Uh, our headquarter is in Warsaw in the Q22, very high building in that. We have experienced staff from the builds in UK, in Finland, in Sweden also, and United Arab Emirates. Some of these people were working with the so, so key organizational support by global partners. Significant part of the team has worked with the, for the Polish regulator. The team has experience in preparing application for in the in general opinion, team of engineers. You know, we have to transfer the knowledge, but you have to have the giver and the switch taker of this. So, so we are working very, very hard on that to, to have a qualified people. We started from being an intelligent customer to be intelligent uh, recipient of the technology. So we have the early work agreement with GE Hitachi, with Laurentis, then master service agreement with, with, with OPG subsidiary. We work with Jacobs and many institutions from Poland. We actually are giving all, doing all the environmental assessments with the Polish company. We analyze initially 80 sites. Okay, 30 were the first deeper round and seven preferred location. We asked for the decision in general, the pol political, but only for six locations we left Warsaw for the time being, because we are discussing with the, with the municipality. And this is the selected site. You will see that still west of Poland is, and they're actually coming to us, why we are not on this map? So the public is it's, it's, uh, very positive with that. Blue is actually the heat generation, the, the green is. But in general, we have the policy, no single watt wasted. So every watt should be faced. Kalev, you were right. It's about 60, 64. That's the same for Poland. If you are over 60% for yes, you are very well in this situation. But in general, you know, people are very, 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 so we have positive for the nuclear, and also in, in my yard, by the way. Because of these munis municipalities being aware of this carbon footprint, they are very much pushing for deployment, actually, at their yard. So this is a very unique situation. If we miss that, this window will never repeat. So current status work of Poland, so we, we obtained this six decision in principle, we twist with some political term oil. Maybe we went a little bit too fast with six applications at the same time. Uh, uh, this decision in principle is actually a political blessing. Go ahead, it is, it is compatible with our energy strategy. We don't see any problems with this location and so on and so on. It was not a problem-free way, but, but we got it. And actually, very few days ago, we agreed with the environmental authority on the content. Yes, I'm going. So project, we are a part of the project. Phoenix, by the way, you heard today about Phoenix. Call to nuclear. We have also own Polish project, which is actually decarbonization of the Polishes, which is called Desire. So we are working together with them. Mainly, actually, the, the Phoenix project is based that US is offering its own expertise to help you to prepare the strategy for decarbonization. It's nothing less, nothing more than that. And then last, I was also asked, you know, the people, oh, this OSG is everywhere. Suddenly it's also in the, in, in, in the UK. So for the people who doesn't know that this is a program, British Energy Security Strategy, to realize the UK government strategy, 24 gigawatts by 2050. By the way, very similar to the Polish ambitions, by the way. So they, they opened this Future Nuclear Enabling Fund, and two companies got, got funding. It's not a huge money, but for the preparatory work for this. <coughs> uh, it's 33 million British pounds for GE Hitachi, and Holtec is the second. And the SG, Synthos Green Energy, as an investor and developer specializing in SMR, our company is eager to invest in the UK and lead the way in several BW. RX 300 projects. Out of the record, this is also the signal for the Polish 
for the Polish government. If you will make our life too difficult, we will go to UK with this, with this program. But, but of course, uh, we, have, we understand that we can make it very much cheaper if we do the huge European alliance. Thank you very much for your attention. If any question, I can just... No. I live in Chicago now. It's a cold city. When weather about like this comes, I know I feel much better seeing it arrive surrounded by a fortress of nuclear plants. I lived in California before that, and when you saw nice weather coming, it might be blackout weather. So there's a difference between those two things. If you asked, if you suddenly declared an emergency poll, a democratic poll, and asked the citizens of Chicago, are you willing to live with a cluster of nuclear plants uh, 80 kilometers from the center of the city? I don't know whether the answer would be yes, even as Chicago residents can barely remember blackouts, have some of the cheapest and cleanest power of the world, I don't know if they would suddenly say yes if a, if a vote was put upon them. You have a vibrant democracy here in Estonia. You have issues here that I don't think we will ever face in, in America, and you have your own concerns that you'll need to deal with when you introduce the concept of a nuclear plant. It is only right and just that nuclear is a topic of democratic debate. It is one of the most important things you can do as a country. And here's my question. If you decide, yes, after a debate, we will have nuclear, what would come next? What would need to be done to prepare the nation? What would need to be done to prepare for the responsibility and the privilege of having nuclear energy? If the answer is no, what then? Where's your energy going to come from? And how will you proceed in an uncertain world where energy security and climate change obligations would seem to be in conflict here? I'm very pleased to look uh, that this debate is coming in some form here to the stage today. Members of the Parliament of the Republic of Estonia will be joining us to discuss these issues directly. We'll have Katrin Arma of Estonian Public Broadcasting to moderate and introduce our speakers. My name is Katrin Arma, and it's time to talk to decision makers. I would now like to invite uh, representatives of uh, um, uh, different political parties. Welcome uh, Joko Alender from Reform Party, Raina Epler from Conservative People's Party, Lauri Lauds from uh, Keskerakon Centre Party, Preet Lom from Social Democrats, Andres Metsoja from Pro Patria Party, and Thomas Ebo from Estonia 200. And now, once we have acquainted us to the final report of the Nuclear Energy Working Group, I would like to ask, what is your personal attitude towards uh, nuclear capacities in Estonia? Preet Lom, please. Yes, thank you very much. First, thank you very much for uh, these discussions. And my personal opinion is that we should think along more. And also, um, concerning all the questions that have been asked over time, we don't necessarily have an answer, but everybody is also putting it to practice uh, their points of view. Now, what concerns Social Democrats, we have decided already for some time ago that uh, we will not be supporting implementation of nuclear uh, energy in Estonia. And the reason is not that we are against technology, but uh, in our view, we first would have to answer some other questions. 
for example, uh, once um, we uh, can implement uh, nuclear energy, will we uh, at that point in time uh, have a place or a role for nuclear energy in our uh, energy portfolio? And in uh, our view, also the time frame that has been mentioned is far too optimistic. And although the minister dis didn't mention it, but all uh, the minutes of um, the meetings ha are public and uh, it has been said that the optimistic prognosis would not be 9 to 11 years, it would be 15 to 17 years instead. And uh, therefore, uh, I think that this uh, approach in the energy sector um, is, um, should not be uh, that let's start um, walking, let's start uh, doing, and then uh, we'll see when we will uh, reach the goal. And although expectations could be positive, uh, we are doing in uh, the wrong um, order. But I would like to specify uh, among social democrats, uh, it says, according to a study of Kantar, that uh, among uh, supporters of social democrats, the majority are still uh, for uh, the um, uh, nuclear energy. But the uh, in order situation when energy prices are high, it's very easy to support it. And when we initiated this discussion first, one um, uh, nuclear uh, SMR was uh, um, talked about. Now they talk already about four um, small uh, reactors, but it cannot be uh, uh, a case where we take uh, a decision based on uh, um, only um, uns uh, insufficient um, amount of information. Now the next speaker is um, uh, um, uh, Thomas Weber from uh, Estonia 200. Well, as in all political parties in our political party, Estonia 200, there are different opinions. But still, I have a feeling that there are more supporters of nuclear energy in our party. And definitely, supporting nuclear energy would be a decision that affects life in Estonia greatly. And looking at the uh, report, uh, uh, the report answers the same uh, question uh, that Preet already mentioned. Uh, it uh, is clear that there is place for nuclear energy in Estonia. Now the question about whether we should use this opportunity is a question of political uh, debate. And I do agree uh, with Preet uh, and what he said, that uh, we don't have this big picture of energy sector. Um, what is our final goal? Also, when uh, talking about uh, renewable energies in uh, this sector, um, I have a feeling also that we are running in different directions. But we should um, design a bigger, pic bigger picture with um, different actors. Uh, but uh, if you ask me personally, my personal opinion is rather or preferably yes. But uh, everything or all these questions have to be solved during uh, the process. And uh, we know what uh, the... Um, direction is, uh, what the trend is, and during this process we will have to ans uh, answer the questions, uh, and that's quite normal. And I think that the beginning of this process has been quite okay. What about uh, Reform Party? Joko Lentar, please. Uh, I think that um, 
Uh, yes, we were put uh, on uh, the same uh, picture already with uh, my neighbor here. We were waving the flags already. But uh, based on uh, what was said previously, and especially based on what Preet uh, said, I recalled uh, an anecdote um, from my childhood where it said that let's wait until all cars have passed and then let's cross the road. But um, talking about discussions in uh, a reform party after this report was published, uh, I would say uh, that um, in uh, the parliament, uh, we uh, will uh, definitely uh, start working on uh, all the questions uh, that um, uh, are about this long process. Yes, definitely we will start. And as it has been mentioned earlier, Rigikoku or the parliament is the institution where the final decision is taken. But when we look into the future, it's clear that clean energy is decisive from the point of view of competition because uh, selling out our na natural resources, uh, either um, I, uh, let it be uh, 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 either oil shale or also timber, that is uh, s s uh, working against ourselves. And uh, another aspect that I would like to underline that is very important uh, for me personally as well, and it was stated in the report as well, that uh, uh, beside, um, in addition to nuclear energy, we cannot let go any investments to renewable energy. Rein Epler from uh, the uh, Estonian um, um, Estonian uh, Conservative Party. I was of the same opinion even before the report was published as I am now. And uh, mm, uh, if we would uh, ask a question, uh, what will happen if Estonia says no, no, then uh, we have an example of Germany uh, because uh, they are now uh, using um, uh, coal and uh, also burning gas. So I uh, am uh, uh, supportive, but I have also expressed some critical thoughts about this report. On the one hand, the political uh, um, um, level um, it is popular to nowadays state that we need the wind and also solar energy, and it's also pointed out in bold in this uh, report. But uh, in uh, reality, that is not the case. Yesterday, I was talking to a representative of Vattenfall from Sweden, and Sweden is exporting. Uh, energy and in Sweden they also focusing on wind energy so they uh, think that maybe more energy can be created for industry well but it's a separate topic whether it would be faster to implement wind energy or uh, um, nuclear energy so Sweden is using uh, this uh, as a bridge but Estonia, we don't have enough of base load, and we should uh, start uh, working on this. And uh, some more words about wind energy. And uh, we saw some information uh, about different countries, and uh, also um, <clears throat> Denmark um, was uh, uh, pointed out as a country where energy is very expensive. And maybe I shouldn't say it, uh, but um, uh, it might be uh, the reason is that uh, they have invested so much into wind energy. But now um, it's uh, also possible to uh, 
uh, express an opinion that maybe it would have been cheaper if they would have invested into nuclear energy instead. And I uh, would also like to praise organizers of uh, this conference because uh, we have had very good presentations, very good uh, concentrated information during 15 minutes from where to learn. Uh, and so uh, social democrats uh, should also learn. Lauri Latz is next from the Center Party. <clears throat> When we are speaking about our party's position, then the debates are still underway. We have not formed uh, our final position yet, but given the current information, then I personally would like to say no. And I, let me explain. It's not that uh, uh, nuclear power plant, wind, and uh, solar are alternatives, but actually we do not have a big picture, and this is a problem, and different specialists and energy specialists have pointed out this. They have spoken about this, and as long as we do not have a whole uh, big picture and economic analysis, then it is very difficult for us to make any uh, uh, groundbreaking decisions here. Uh, we have just let this thing go. Uh, we have small uh, wind and solar developments, and they continue the development. Now we are speaking about more additional capacities uh, in the form of the nuclear plant. We just got news from Germany that they have also decided now to start using gas, and Este Energia is also trying to start or w wants to start using gas again. And when we look at this cash flow and investment that is being planned over the coming years into this sector, this is just huge. We are speaking about if you put everything together and, our, and uh, look at our needs for develop both the P uh, transmission and distribution networks. We're speaking about eight, nine billion. And this is a huge amount of money. And we should not throw this money to the wind. In this sense, you're correct. And that is why we need uh, uh, proper analysis by the state. And this should be displayed to all of us. And on the basis of that, we should pick the best model, whether the nuclear power plant is part of it or not. That that is uh, That needs to be decided then on the basis of the big picture. We cannot uh, make any decisions on the basis of the current information. And another problem. Today, we are discussing here nuclear issues, nuclear, nuclear energy issues. In another place, we are speaking about solar and wind. But there is no debate yet on the networks, the grids. We just try to take bits and pieces from here and there. But this is not right. We have to develop everything together. So, and Andres Metsoya from the Propatria Party. Thank you. If possible. Uh, to give the innovation award to someone, then we would give this to Fermi Energia because uh, innovation does not start from us discussing things here, but rather someone puts money in it, takes risks, and tries to create a new value space by doing this so that uh, on the macroeconomic um, plain, our government, our state would develop better and people would have a good life and uh, companies would be competitive. I remember this debate. Uh, one Estonian president said that what took us here will not take us further, which is correct. And we are in the same situation now when it comes to energy. It is not reasonable to speak about what we rule out, but we should rather agree about what we are going to do. This is what is going to take us further. And the question of whether the report gave us additional information, yes, it definitely did. Uh, namely, that Estonian state should take an obligation of 100 million euros. And if we were to choose uh, uh, between personal state, 100 million uh, or 200 million, and uh, nuclear, uh, 100 million, I wouldn't have uh, uh, any doubts here because uh, the 100 million will. Uh, create more competitiveness. And uh, this project is also regional uh, inside Estonia. A, people, a person from the countryside is 
very often thinking nuclear energy, where it comes from, is it uh, green, is it oil shale? The, they just want to have uh, electricity in their homes. And when we are building an uh, uh, Estonia, where in cities you have to be able to uh, fix everything in 15 minutes, but then in the countryside you have to stay f for a week without electricity, then it is very difficult to explain for this person uh, the, the, the reasons. So this is a problem, uh, issue that has to be taken into account as well. I agree with my colleague here that we have to look at the big picture. and. Uh, uh, not not a single of a politic of, of our political parties cannot say uh, that um, nuclear is not going there uh, nuclear is not uh, is a no go on that means that uh, the Swedes and Finns are they stupid I visited Sweden as well and saw what was happening there and uh, a lot of my doubts were eliminated before we continue you people can also ask questions uh, by using microphones from among the audience. Or you can use Slido for your questions. As a journalist, I also want to know about the time frame. So when will the discussion start in the parliament? And, and why hasn't the government uh, approved the final report? I can only uh, speak as a member of parliament. Our position uh, of being doubtful, uh, uh, that means that we cannot uh, see that those who are, say, who are for uh, this um, development, uh, this is just as a counterweight for that. Because in this uh, report, we cannot say a direct yes or direct no. Uh, but, but we are waiting for the, gov for the government to make the decision, because the parliament is going to look at the decision that the, or the proposals that the government is going to give us. But this yes, but what we uh, uh, support it has to do with uh, also the question yes, but, because Questions have to be asked in both cases. And uh, Andres mentioned uh, innovation. This is what the businesses uh, can undertake only. And a few days ago, we had a debate on nuclear energy. We had local people joining the debate from Mitaviruma. And uh, he said that uh, this um, discussion and the lobby activities have been too aggressive from the part of the private sector. Uh, it is nothing, we cannot blame the developer here, but this also makes the, re uh, the parliament, uh, puts the parliament in a position where it seems to be that the parliament uh, has to make decisions about uh, everything, like where exactly, who's going to do this, not only yes and no, but I'm not a member of the government, so I don't know why the government has not made a decision yet. Yeah, I would like to comment on two things, Jan uh, I can also speak as a member of parliament, and uh, uh, I cannot speak about uh, the members of uh, government, but I have this information that uh, it's the social democrats that do not want to uh, discuss this in the government. But uh, if you, you, you're speaking about yes, but, uh, uh, yes, we, it is not only nuclear issues that come to question here. I don't think, uh, I've noticed that people do not want to read long documents. I did read it. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of questions for yes, but, for which answers have to be found in the next phases. But the main thing is to get uh, acquainted with the information presented. Lauri Lanemitz. First of all, I don't think that it's a bad thing that uh, the government has not uh, brought this document to the parliament yet. That gives us a possibility to discuss more and in broader terms. Uh, and the general society, pub general public is also becoming more aware of this. This is a good thing. But And then when we look at the opinion polls that were also posted up here, then the opinion polls were conducted when 
there were no active debates going on. We definitely have to uh, follow what the general public thinks, and we have to create broad-based debates both outside the parliament and then also in the parliament for decision-making, finally. I think that the government has behaved properly in the sense that if they just were to put this report to the parliament without the government's main decisions or main positions concerning uh, the future energy mix of Estonia, also taking into account the network fees and things like that, then it is nothing to discuss. Yet. Yeah, we can agree about uh, many things in the report. We could say that uh, building something uh, nearer than 50 kilometers from the Russian border, whether this is a good idea or not. But um, we should be able to answer the questions of the people, of uh, companies. Uh, is it it's in the same way uh, in our security uh, situation, we all agree about something and the same uh, thing applies to our, eco our economy. Uh, if we cannot agree about the future energy price for Estonia, it all comes down to that. We cannot just uh, plan any future investments if we do not make these decisions. Joko Alender, I would like to make the following comparison. For a long time, we were in Estonia in a situation where in every energy-related debate and <laughs> every meeting bit between families and friends, you could always hear this, you do not spit into the old well before the new one's been built. And I think this way of thinking did not allow us to act for a long time. And we were not able to admit that oil shale-based energy is not sustainable. And many decisions were postponed, were delayed. And that is why we also saw those price tables in the presentations. So if we wait for the parliament to decide whether 50 kilometers is OK, this is not even true and has nothing to do with reality. The parliament can decide in principle whether this type of energy, nuclear energy, whether this type of nuclear energy would be suitable for Estonia, given subject to certain conditions. And what comes next in the coming decade is up for many other decisions and decision makings, makers. And the parliament can just open the door by for those next steps before uh, before the next steps can be taken. And what does the parliament also say uh, by m making this decision? Namely, we principally understand that consumption of energy is not going to drop. And, and when we want to place our economy within the nature or natural environment, this also depends on electrification. It's definitely important. And I wouldn't want to wait to this, uh, with this debate, just like we delayed the uh, decision about uh, exiting from using fossil fuels. And it was the last uh, government that finally set a deadline uh, and this was finally a specific, concrete decision that was made. I do agree with what Yoko said, that we cannot wait all the world's cars to pass before we cross the road. But this uh, failure to make decisions uh, could turn out to be a big problem at one point. And speaking about all these fears that we don't know this and that, and the third thing, Obviously, the parliament is not a group of specialists in nuclear energy that will be able to answer these questions. Speaking more about fears, as a pilot, I've been working with people uh, who are afraid of flying. And there are some who don't even come close to the airport whenever they hear the plane flying, they already um, become seasick or something. But what I would like to see in this debate is that this curiosity 
although I have, I, I am worried or I've, I'm afraid of something, but I would like to know something. Today I am meeting these people who, who are saying just, uh, I don't want to hear about it at all. This is one of the problems that could be solved so that people w- would get explanations about what nuclear energy means. And eventually, we are not deciding today whether the nuclear plant comes to Estonia or not. We are speaking today about the creating the legislative framework. And naturally, many questions come up that need to be answered within the within this process, but failure to make decisions might become very uh, expensive for us at one point. Uh, Time is running, and uh, let's speak about money now. This is um, one of the important things in economy, in energy security, and energy independence. So what does it mean if we agree to create nuclear capacity in Estonia. What does this mean for the state, entrepreneurs, and the consumers uh, uh, in terms of money? Rain Epler. Well, life will show. But if we were to believe the numbers that were presented today on these um, slides about our near neighbors, uh, leaving Norway aside because of their natural uh, um, conditions. And one of the things in the report that made me slightly sad was that when it comes to financing, they are speaking about contract for difference, a guaranteed price level. I would be rather be happy if we could uh, create the plant without it. But the more we have uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, the more need there is to have uh, controlled capacity in the form of a nuclear power plant, for example. We are creating two forms of uh, energy to achieve this one goal, and that means that it is going to be more expensive. And speaking about the life cycle, then this seems to be quite simple to calculate when the initial investment could for could be higher for nuclear uh, and, mm, than the offshore wind farms. Offshore wind farms life cycle is 20 years or so plus decommissioning, decom- which is not being spoken at all at present for wind farms. But if we have... Uh, capacity that does not depend on the weather that covers our need and also helps uh, uh, us uh, uh, export uh, to other countries as well. That means that it is a gain-gain situation or win-win situation. And hopefully people uh, will will be more um, interested after this conference. Uh, you could Google Ontario Green Energy Act and read about this. So what happened in uh, Ontario? The people who uh, first were only for wind and sol- uh, solar are now for nuclear. But um, the political balance also changed in on, on Ontario. Uh, those who had developed uh, wind and solar with using taxpayer money And finally, there were huge expenses and unstable uh, electricity uh, provision. So now they are, uh, uh, so they have gotten out of the government, and now other people are running uh, Ontario, and they understand that stability is better. If we say no uh, to developing nuclear, what are the financial consequences? First, I think we should go back to the issue of lobbying. This is quite important. And different producers and different uh, types of energy, uh, different producers have to uh, present what they are doing. And you only get information, one-sided information, then I, as a politician, uh, will know that definitely there's going to be a counterbalance. And in the case of such a big project, these problem issues have to be uh, brought out very honestly by showing the different analysis. And that 
That takes me to the issue of finances. Oh, the, the cost of both the creating uh, or building and the cost of, uh, or the final, the price, uh, electricity price. Only recently uh, in the Swedish media, uh, there was a scientific report coming out by Blecking University of what it was where the uh, the uh, price forecasts for, uh, for, for where, uh, uh, where they thought that they were doubtful they were going to be co co much, so much higher. And when we look at the current presentations here, uh, then uh, these, these are based on already known prices, but uh, what when looking into the future, we uh, uh, are just dealing with forecasts. So that is why we look forward to this Ontario project. And I have understood that in the government, in the coalition, they want to uh, put together the so-called big picture in parallel. And I think this is a good thing. And I don't think that all their cars will be part of the big picture. This is not possible. But one thing is clear, consumption is uh, going to increase and we need to have clean energy to uh, make up for this increase. So these financial things are the ones where the biggest uh, questions lie. Yes, talking about costs, I also wanted to add that we have uh, recently um, received additional information that probably the final prices will be uh, higher and we have to look into the future with uh, good knowledge uh, about uh, how things will uh, work out. And then there was also here a, a slide about how uh, tax incomes in Estonia will win uh, on uh, creating uh, such a big uh, <clears throat> um, enterprise. But uh, of course, it's uh, true uh, as well. But uh, it would be also really sad, or I would like to try to avoid a situation if we uh, uh, take a decision hastily um, and in three years' time or seven years' time, we would find ourselves in a situation uh, that uh, where, where we would know that um, money was used in, ve in vain. And uh, we know also uh, that uh, uh, although prognosis have been made uh, that um, in uh, institutions uh, the number of uh, employees will uh, decrease, that still tends not to be the case. So therefore, this yes or no answer uh, has to be preceded by uh, discussions. And um, definitely the government or the state has a strategic or participation um, in uh, the whole process. Uh, and uh, the state should be also uh, not only uh, the institution that creates the legal framework, but uh, uh, the state should have uh, more information before taking these uh, decisions. That is uh, the case, and I really think that we need to discuss whether participation of the government is necessary at all. If the vote in the parliament will be 55% against, 51% uh, against the rest. If there will be a lot of lobby work done, we will use lots of uh, millions. Uh, and uh, then uh, the answer will be uh, uh, no. Anyhow, we will have to thoroughly discuss. First, Thomas will be the next speaker and Ryan after that. Yes, uh, whatever the decisions uh, will be that we take now, nobody of us knows what the future will be. 
and in life generally as well. We take decisions all the, without knowing what the future will be. But it doesn't mean that we will not take any decisions at all. So there is always this risk. But my suggestion is that despite all these worries and questions, we have to start moving in order to learn more about whether it's um, uh, rational, uh, whether uh, it should be done or not. It uh, has to be uh, um, discussed uh, for the whole thing to be very clear for uh, the state. But um, the question about participation of uh, the uh, state or not, I, I think that from uh, the point of view of uh, the government, it's not easy to work if, uh, the, um, if it's unclear how much, what the final cost of the whole process will be. But as Rain said, uh, the government will be earning money back also. And uh, uh, I would just uh, like to react uh, on uh, what uh, Preet said. Of course, I like uh, joking, but I have not been joking today. But what Preet said, what Andre said, uh, we should have a thorough analysis both on participation of the state, uh, on the price uh, of the whole project, I think that instead it's uh, important to make a principal decision about whether Estonia will be uh, continuing analyzing a nuclear process or not. There are so many steps to be taken before we will start deciding uh, upon uh, whether we will uh, build a nuclear power plant or not. And there is an example from Austria where they started constructing it, but the whole thing became a concert hall instead. So uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, need for feeling like now or never. There is uh, still uh, time enough for making these decisions about who is going to do the construction work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, right now, it's popular to use uh, these uh, words of uh, small uh, modular uh, reactors, SMRs, and uh, even uh, in uh, in uh, construction works, uh, they try to. Um, uh, use modular details like steel bricks, etc., etc. But uh, uh, I would still uh, like to call upon not to close the door for one very important energy source. Now, um, talking about Lauri and Preet, I'd like to say that it's uh, uh, clear and visible that they have been uh, friends for a long time. But um, uh, the discussion about the prices uh, uh, in the report, we do have some uh, numbers about potential prices, but probably time will show, as colleagues also have stated. But in uh, this um, debate as a whole, we should also talk about what are we willing to uh, reach, what kind of a situation for people to use power, uh, however want much they want to use power, whenever they want to use power, and for an affordable price. And nobody has answered this question yet. And in the Committee of uh, Economic Affairs, we have also been discussing this, but what would be your answer? Uh, my point of view is that if we only talk about the price of power and what um, electricity is uh, produced uh, of, 
that's not fair uh, for consumers because uh, when uh, consumers pay their bills, these bills consist of different um, uh, smaller parts like the greed payment, greed fees, etc., etc. And in the future, it might happen that all of these other components will be more expensive than the price of the power itself. So we can't take uh, this kind of uh, decisions uh, bit by bit. It has to be uh, made, decisions have to be made based on holistic approaches. Well, in Austria, they were uh, building and constructing and uh, uh, they could afford it that it finally became a concert hall, but in Estonia we can't afford it. And um, if we decide to continue with investing taxpayers' money, then if there will be such a decision uh, in the Estonian parliament, Riigi uh, uh, then uh, from starting from that moment, uh, uh, state money is uh, will be used as well. To a certain extent, I do agree with uh, Rain Epler. This is like uh, the project of Rail Baltic. If uh, um, too many things are put down, then uh, on a daily basis, uh, there are many people who doubt uh, uh, whether it's uh, reasonable to continue with this project and another uh, project that probably not is uh, not is reasonable either is uh, the wind park of Tozi. And uh, if the same thing would happen to the uh, nuclear power plant project, then my question would be. Who would come to Estonia to invest here? And if decisions are made, then they have to be implemented, put into practice, as they do in Finland, for example. But in our country, it tends to be like this, that, OK, let's build a nuclear plant, but where shall we put the waste? Somewhere else. Uh, but in an investment environment, this is not the way uh, how things work. And here I think that Estonia should um, introduce a change in the paradigm because uh, we uh, can afford to take these decisions bit by bit. We have, but we cannot lie to uh, Estonian people. So uh, uh, the parliament can show a green light, but there are different development stages in between. And we cannot say that this or that question we will answer later. But right now, it seems that uh, we still We'll have to postpone some of the questions because our time is over, and I would like to wish you all the success in further discussions. Thank you. The Letipa Peninsula is one of the suitable locations for the nuclear power plant, but it has a special geological bedrock. Uh, there is an old uh, valley and very s relatively uh, high uh, groundwork, groundwater level. But there are solutions that could be used to build a foundation for the plant. Uh, and Arti, Arti Aosar from the Steiger Engineering Office is going to share with us his thoughts about what was found in the boreholes and what's to be done in this situation. Good afternoon. So I'm going to tell you what uh, we did in um, this Leti Papol pen, pen, Peninsula. Uh, <clears throat> so I gave you a... Uh, Open, uh, uh, uh.
I gave you a good cold picture after this heated discussion. I think it is the main thing is to find uh, an opening slide that sets the tone. And I think Ayn Leva, the photographer, has uh, put a finger on it, really. It is a real situation from our site. The geologist Sven is not very happy because it's cold outside. <clears throat> But this is the work that uh, geologists have to do in order to get information from the Earth. Uh, and it has to be fact-based information on the basis of which you make decisions. So this is my opening slide, which very well um, describes what we are going to do or what we are doing. But first, I would like to also share with you uh, what our company is about. Uh, We've been on the market for 20 years. This year, we've been working for quite some time already. And um, uh, we have a broad selection of services, but our main competences have to do with industry and the earth. Uh, we are uh, one of the largest and leading uh, engineering offices <coughs> dealing with these issues. We ha have about 60 employees. Uh, we have a, a private limited company. And we are a really good private limited company because our owners are our employees. That means that everything is so well when the experts uh, who are doing the work uh, also uh, manage the company. We have the headquarters in Tallinn. And we have actually three offices in Tartu, Tallinn. And since 2020, we have a subsidiary in India, in Hyderabad. So when you end up there, uh, you're welcome to coffee in our place. And about our growth, since 20 years, we have been uh, growing quite uh, considerably. Our turnover is now four and a half million euros. On the world scale, it's nothing but in Estonia, quite a reasonable size. And then let's look at what we did in Letiba and what the goal of the study was. We ha had to establish whether Letiba would be suitable for the BWRX 300 reactors foundation. And, and we had to take into account uh, this, um, uh, this uh, valley. Uh, and I'm going to sh and find out what the morphology is of this valley. Here's the geological map of the area. The green shows bedrock, uh, bedrock rocks. And here you can see this r red area of the valley, the Mahu Valley. We knew already from before that from the this uh, is dates back to ice age, and it has a different material in it. And there's um, uh, mm, blue clay, which is the main thing there, lont of uh, blue clay. And uh, there's different quaternarian sediments there. And uh, it's a big difference whether you build the reactor uh, in one or the other place here in the valley. So this was the important thing that we had to establish during this survey, that what the geological and construction conditions would be. And we also had to find out what the slope of the valley looked like. So that was the main goal of our survey. Once uh, we had this goal, yes, we knew about this goal, and then we developed our program for solving this and finding answers to this, um, uh, these questions. We had a construction and geological uh, preliminary study. First, it was geographical and physical studies. Then we had drilling works and field works, and then work in the laboratory, data analysis, and uh, reporting. So this is how we did it. Uh, and uh, as a uh, previous speaker said, uh, we, are, we also admit that we are not uh, experts in everything. We involve the University of Tartu, uh, IPT project management, and tractable engineering. So this, we were, were a group of four, group of four experts who carried out this work. And let, now let's speak about uh, geophysics. 
so you get a crash course about this. I've been explaining this at schools, and I've explain it like that. You go to the doctor and before you uh, undergo an operation, you'll get uh, x-ray or some uh, ultrasound in, mm, before uh, the, the surgery. So geophysics is practically the same for the Earth or the crust of the Earth. So that uh, you, you can uh, look into the Earth and understand what's in there without using these penetrative tests. So we had a seismic profile created by the University of Tartu. As you remember, there was this ancient valley. So we had uh, a study straight, uh, straight across of the valley and they used seismics. They created seismic uh, waves uh, on the top of on the ground and then they went into the earth and they um, measured the time it took from the waves to move. And on the basis of that it was possible to extrapolate what was in the uh, within the earth. And the geophysic physicists uh, will see the different uh, important elements here. So it was easy and s uh, fast methods that we could use in order to start understanding what was there in the Earth. This was just preliminary um, survey. And on the basis of that, we rearranged the locations of our boreholes. But once we completed this geophysics, then the next, we went to the field for drilling because geophysics gives you good information, but it is not the final truth yet. In our uh, professional circles, uh, we speak that when you ask an engineer uh, or geophysics, uh, the, then the, how much is two plus two, then uh, the geophysicist says four. The geologist says, well, there's be something between three and five, and the physicist asks, what would you like? this to be. This does not mean that the first one told you a lie, but it is just uh, that you get different levels of precision. But the geophysics do not give you a final answer, but it gives you a good picture before surgery. And eventually we had to, went, had to go for uh, drilling as well. So we had boreholes uh, let 01 for 60 meters, let 02 for 80 meters. Huh. Uh, so we, we just wanted to see both the, what is the slope on the valley and um, mm, what's in the do uh, bottom there. And then we had also uh, penetration tests, SLP1, um, in order to find out the important parameters there as well. So we had two of those as well. And then uh, not a single geologist leaves a borehole uh, without taking out every piece of information that was possible. So we did gamma ray logging. It sounds like a very horrible name, but this is a very ordinary survey because every rock has its natural gamma ray phone. And with this logging, you could um, determine where the different layers are. And we also looked at the level of the groundwater uh, because um, once you had the boreholes. Well, that's so much about the field work. But then next, what is it that we learned and what we did next? Then first, we took the drill cores and described them, and we found 14 different layers from the geological and construction point of view could have different parameters. You can see these uh, layers here, and I'm not going to go into detail, but the important thing is that 40, 34 uh, samples were taken for 114 different analysis and tests in order to understand what the uh, parameters for construction would be, because that would be important knowledge for uh, creating the foundation. And every layer was calculated uh, also specific geo technical um, indicators. And once all this information was put together, this geophysics, the um, descriptions of the drill course, 
uh, and laboratory analysis, we ended up with this uh, um, overview that was called prepared by Tractable, which takes into account all the different uh, pieces of information that we got. Uh, and this is quite good information already for designing and, and building, because that tells you at what levels, what different layers are and what they are made of, so that you can decide where the foundation could be built. So this was what we did. And as a result of our work, we did not find any aspect that would uh, let us say that the foundation could not be built there. But we did find additional information that should be taken into account f for future design and building work. And Tractable already used this information uh, in developing the concept for the foundation. So that was the investigation that we did and the work that we did. And it was a standard thing for us. You'd think that, well, nuclear reactor, what is needed for that? But the approach is really a standard approach. But one thing that was not standard for us and was really a first for us was this interest towards our activities. Up until borehole drilling in Letibia, I thought that the most famous borehole was the 926-meter borehole that we drilled in uh, Baltiski. But I was so wrong, because as soon as we started work in Letibia, the journalists came up, what are you doing? Where are you drilling? There's lots of newspaper articles written, and the journalists uh, phoned and called, how far down are you already? So there's this title of uh, head headline in the newspaper, or drilling work is already 44 meters. Uh, so at, we had 60 and 80 meters of boreholes there, but we had actually drilled uh, almost a kilometer in Baltiski. So they were really interested. And uh, the final piece of news was that, that the UK the, the borehole has now finally been drilled. So it was so funny for us. But it was an interesting aspect that we hadn't uh, experienced before because uh, we've uh, done a lot of work in different uh, environments and for different constructions. But this was this accompanying bonus for us. And it was quite interesting to communicate with the press. Uh, they came to see us, took pictures, and were actually quite happy. At the beginning, I showed you a slide about uh, our company, but uh, sometimes uh, our uh, people uh, can work also in places where the view is beautiful and it's not so cold and bad. The miracle of nuclear energy is in many ways a miracle of nuclear fuel. You ha can have a very small amount of fuel, can get a very large amount of power. This is one of the many things that confuses people who are trying to learn more because they think there will be some enormous amount of mining, enormous amount of travel, m enormous amount of installation work to make nuclear fuel work, when what they're really thinking is all the work required to mine, move, and then burn coal and natural gas. But the nuclear fuel is still very important as we saw when uh, war broke out, and suddenly I heard all up and down Germany, we can't turn on our nuclear plants, all nuclear fuel comes from Russia. Of course, that's false, but that's the level of confusion around nuclear fuel. I'm very pleased to introduce to you Ove Nilsson of Vattenfall Nuclear Fuel to explain to you how exactly nuclear fuel proc procurement really works. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you, Fermi and Hegia, for inviting Vattenfall to speak at this fifth anniversary. And as my, uh, might you rem remember, my colleague Desiree Comstead said this morning that Vattenfall has extensive uh, experience from operating nuclear facilities in Sweden since a long time back. 
but we also have extensive uh, experience from the front end business and also the back end. So the front end in this uh, case is the nuclear fuel supply. Uh, yeah, I will go into the front end process and I will also speak a little about our company, Waterfall Nuclear Fuel, and also about sourcing and market prices as uh, just recently was mentioned that there happened a, a lot of things two years ago. So the front-end process and Vattenfall uh, nuclear fuel is very active in all these four areas. Uh, we purchase uh, uranium from, from mines and uh, going into next step that is conversion there is a transfer to something like we used to call yellow cake, U308. And after the conversion, you have it in either gas form or in solid form, a really practical form to, to transport and also to make the next important step to the enrichment to uh, enrich the, the m amount of uranium to up to five, maximum of 5%. And the last step that we heard a lot about so far is the fabrication of the actual fuel. So this is a quite uh, long and uh, extensive process, of course, uh, and takes some time from mining to having a uh, nuclear fuel. It's not working. So I will take it from the beginning. Oh, no, you haven't, <laughs> you have heard, okay. Yeah, yes. So that's more or less the front-end process, and we are working with that. We have been doing this for several years, way back when the nuclear fleets in Vattenfall were established in the 70s in Sweden. Uh, so this is the company, fully owned by Vattenfall Group, about 65 employees. We have something called integrated fuel supply, and that's more or less the whole process from the beginning from that you have a demand somewhere uh, and we will purchase this uranium and the whole way uh, up to that we would deliver a fuel bundle to the nuclear f uh, power plant. We are also responsible for software, uh, providing software to the nuclear power plants, uh, mostly related to, to nuclear design and fuel uh, applications. And we also have engineering services, of course, safety analysis and, and nuclear design and so on. So that's more or less our company. Uh, something about mission and vision. Uh, our mission is quite important, uh, we think. Uh, of course, we should provide our customers with nuclear fuel and related services with high quality in a sustainable supply chain. And the last three words is really important for us and for Vattenfall, that all we do is, should be sustainable in, in some way. And we put a lot of effort into this and a lot of requirements for every purchasing we, we do and every we, um, supplier that we approve uh, working with us in Vattenfall. And of course, we should strengthen our customers by a responsible and cost-effective manner of our operations. Uh, current customers, uh, we have uh, five uh, nuclear power plants in operation still. We have closed down six for political re reasons uh, uh, a couple of years ago. So we have in Vattenfall five nuclear power plants, uh, two PWRs and three BWRs. And Vattenfall also uh, owns two nuclear power plants in Brunsbüttel and Grimwald in Germany, and they are under decommissioning right now. And the, the red one, I think, is the most uh, interesting thing. We signed an LOE with uh, Fermi and Agia this in November last year, and aiming for helping Fermi and, and, and Agia with supplying fuel in the future. So we are quite ex excited about this in helping helping Fermi with this very important front-end process. Uh, 
being a little more detailed and, and uh, maybe complicated some things. But this is what we call integrated fuel supply. Uh, the, old, the, big, the big parts of this uh, uh, going from having a demand in a couple of years later on. Uh, we have a fuel development plan, of course. Uh, what will the fuel look like and consist of uh, in the coming years? We do all the purchasing after that, uh, of course, so that we can, in the end, deliver the right fuel to, to uh, the right nuclear power plant. Uh, if there is new fuels and new designs, we will, must do the fuel licensing and qualify, qualify all the components and the fuel. And the fuel delivery uh, is, is very much to to um, make the design uh, that fits the next coming operation cycle at the nuclear power plant. And the operation at the end that is more or less run by the power plant. So we can have some more details about this. As I mentioned, the demand, we have a strategy, of course, a fuel strategy. Uh, we put in a lot of requirements. We have our own R&D function at the company, so there's a lot of experience and a lot of experiments going on. We have a, a beautiful facility in Sweden, in Stutzvik, a hot cell laboratory that we could make experiments and, and see what's gone wrong with the fuel um, and so on. Uh, there are a lot of new designs and new materials coming in in the, new, in the fuel business. Additive manufacturing is a, is a popular thing, 3D printing. So right now we are licensing a lot of new components that have been 3D printing. Yeah. Uh, and this going to the purchasing, we also are responsible for doing all the audits and all the Approvement of all suppliers to, to our company, and that goes from mining and conversion and enrichment and also the fabrication. And as I mentioned, sustainability and environment is, is quite important for us. So in order to be approved as a, a supplier, they have to fulfill a lot of uh, obligations and requirements connected to sustainability. And security supply uh, also uh, mentioned that that has become even more important after the Russian invasion in Ukraine and what happened in the market after that. So that is very important. Fuel licensing, as I mentioned, qualification. We're doing a lot of safety analysis to see actually that the nuclear fuel that we have designed, that it is capable to, to with to uh, live up to the safety standards and and uh, and, and will will survive or will make uh, the the all the incidents that could occur in a nuclear power plant, and of course we are we must we produce a lot of licensing documentation, of course, for the authorities. In the fuel delivery, we have. Uh, we do the qualification first, the licensing of the fuel or the design, and then we uh, put a lot of effort going out to all the fabrication facilities to actually see that the fuel is produced as the way they say. Uh, and here we do all the, the nuclear design and optimization so that we put in the, the right amount of uranium and so on for the upcoming production cycle. And the arrow at the bottom, we have that we call a key account manager for, for both Horsmarker and for Ringhal. So they are responsible for all the contract management. We have a lot of contracts in each of these four steps and we have to see that we fulfill them and call off the next step in the cycle, if you say so. And we have a lot of logistics and delivery planning and also a lot of financial transactions during this, this um, journey. 
So it could be at least three years from when we, should, when we are going to a licensing a new fuel or something like that. Three years uh, until it will be placed in, in the nuclear power plant. And when we're talking about uh, sourcing uranium and enrichment and conversion, it could be up to five or seven years before it should be used in the power plant. So this is more or less the situation for us today when we are working with Forsberg and Ringals and supplying fuel. Uh, what we will look into right now, both in connection with Fermi and Energia, and of course what will happen in Vattenfall and Sweden with new, new nuclear, hopefully in the future. So then we can add the, the, the bit to, to, to the left, uh, to the support, uh, of course, here. Uh, and the, the, the red line in, in, in the middle is the commercial operation date. So before you, we go into the, the operation, we can support uh, Fermi with, with a lot of, of knowledge and we can review a lot of uh, material document coming from the, the, the reactor supplier. We can do independent analysis and we can also produce or review licensing documentation that will be needed for, for getting a, a permission to operate the nuclear power plant. Uh, so this is what you see in the red circles here. We can also, besides the three things to the right, we can also, uh, in very early st state of the projects, we can work with the fuel licensing. Uh, if, if the operator will have the opportunity to, to choose between several fuel uh, deliveries or, or suppliers. It, uh, it's very important to have that opportunity in the future. Yes, a little bit about contract structure, uh, not going into detail. As I mentioned, we are working with contracts with uh, both mines, conversions, enrichments, and fabricators. And as you see, we can mostly we will sign contracts with, uh, with, one, with one part, either uranium or conversion or enrichment. In some cases we can combine that, we can, we can, we can sign a contract and buy both uranium and, and the conversion. And in some cases it's, it's possible to do all the three first steps. So here is a... a uh, a challenge in some way. Uh, we will will very much like to have more than two suppliers, of course, maybe more in in some some areas. There's a lot of new mines going coming up in the in the market right now, after the prices have went up. Uh, so this is a. a a very important thing to have a mixture of different uh, contracts with flexibility in the contract with options to to buy more or to say no to something some options so this will will actually the foundation to have a security supply in some way um the last slide, and maybe the most interesting, I don't know. I don't have any answers, but that's the, the price, uh, market prices after the Russian invasion. Uh, and I think it's maybe one or two weeks old because the uranium price have broken the magical limit or, or roof of $100 per pound recently. So if you see the uranium and then con conversion, the blue and yellow, they are more than double, double the price in two years and enrichment almost three, do three double, th three times more than two years ago. So that's the, the 
situation right now, and of course, what will happen in the future? Will there be sanctions? There have been a lot of discussions with sanctions against Russia connected to the uranium supply. So far, no sanctions. There's a lot of discussions going on in the US. 2026, they're talking about, we will see. We have an investment fund, a Sprott fund in, in, the, in the US. I think they have been active for four or five, six years. So they are actively investing in uranium. And the $10,000 question is, of course, when will new production capacity come into, into uh, online, actually? So there are, as I mentioned, there's a lot of new mines uh, trying to uh, come into the market. There's a lot of mines that were closed after the Fukushima because of the decrease in demand. Uh, there are a lot of invest investings going on in the conversion and enrichment, but it will take some time. And the companies, they are quite clear they have a clear message. They will not do the mistake once more that, the, that this will end up with overcapacity. So there is, a, yeah, there is some kind of uh, interesting situation between the, the companies and the operators. So, but it had, uh, quite naturally, it had end, ended up in uh, the need of long-term contracts of course, if someone will, will, are willing to, to, to invest a lot of money in the conversion and enrichment, especially they need long-term contracts. So now we are talking, there are not so much left in the 2020s. So if you're going to buy something, you are in, into the 2030s, so that's quite another uh, situation compared with four or five years ago. But Vattenfall has been very successful. Actually, we have secured our operation of the nuclear power plants up to 28, so that's good. We have a conversion to 2030 and enrichment to 2032. So that's good, actually. So we have been success successful in this. And all that I've been talking about uh, and that we are have been learning for more than 30 years. We hope that we can uh, be a major, major player in, in new, new build, of course in Sweden at the Vattenfall, but hopefully helping Fermi in the, in the future as well. So thank you very much. We have one quick thing standing in between all of you and a, and a short coffee break. Um, countries that already have nuclear energy have a, have a very special advantage over countries that don't. They already have the energy. It's a great deal. I love it at home. But countries that do not yet have nuclear energy and are looking today to put a program in place have an interesting advantage not many people talk about. Countries around the world now exploring nuclear energy programs have a chance of establishing the nuclear power and the nuclear waste protocols simultaneously, which might eliminate an enormous amount of pain that countries around the world are having when they develop the nuclear plants and the nuclear fuel and the nuclear waste before they develop their nuclear waste program. Doing them both at the same time is a fascinating advantage for new entry nations. So even before the Estonian parliament decides whether to have a nuclear energy program, or how to deal with nuclear waste. Discussions have been ongoing between Fermi Energia and one of the leading nuclear waste options now emerging in the world uh, from my home country, from Berkeley, California, Deep Isolation. Deep Isolation has been working on a borehole technology that should eliminate a lot of the most difficult and expensive parts of the solution for nuclear waste being implemented in Finland right now. So there are solutions. The dialogue has been going on, and before you all go to coffee, I'd love to invite up Caleb and, uh, from Fermi and Agea, Caleb Kalametz, and 
Chris Parker from Deep Isolation, who have a few words to say to you about collaboration that's been ongoing, and then an important signing here. Gentlemen? Yes, um, so uh, we, yeah, we have been working for some time, yeah. uh, done some studies on understanding deep isolation and different uh, spent fuel management solutions. And uh, last year there was an important vote in European Parliament which approved the technical requirements or, or the essentially sustainable that nuclear is included in uh, uh, taxonomy of sustainable finance. And uh, there are technical requirements that each project, individual investment project, uh, is, uh, can qualify. And one of the requirements is that there must be um, a detailed plan to achieve operational spent fuel repository by 2050. And given Estonian circumstances and the volumes of uh, potential uh, small volumes of uh, spent fuel, and but also given that Estonian geology, uh, well, we have uh, about that uh, a lecture later on, uh, is, is very si similar to Finland and Sweden, then deep borehole solution credibly can be uh, deployed in that time frame that is relevant to meet that uh, requirement. So, Chris, give a, uh, you give a, I give you a word uh, to describe the work that you have done and, uh, and this, what we will sign, is a cooperation agreement or a M MOU to further understand, further respond to questions that we will have, because waste is one of the issues that we get uh, most concern from, from the society. Yes, thank you, Kalev. So yes, very quickly, Deep Isolation is a US-based company. I, I run uh, our European business. Uh, and our sole focus as a company is to answer the question that Estonia will need to answer as it's if, if, it, if the parliament decides to set off down this nuclear journey, what will we do with the waste? Uh, we are bringing to market a safe, scalable, affordable technology for uh, deep geologic disposal in boreholes created with, uh, with drilling technologies that are used on a daily basis in the, in the oil and gas sector. So we're putting together proven technologies from the oil and gas sector with the, the radioactive waste management sector and uh, really delighted that uh, the, the, the partnership that we've been developing with Fermi Energia as right at the outset of this, this process in Estonia, your, you and the, the nuclear working group have been focused on that, that essential question about the, the, the waste. I think Estonia is, is really showing a, a lead here and, and we are delighted to, to, to carry on. The existing work we've done with you as a, as, as a company has, has shown that Estonia as a whole, many communities, many regions in Estonia uh, could safely host a deep borehole disposal. Uh, some of the regions in the north of, of Estonia and the coastal region are, are perhaps particularly suitable or, or easier to drill, lower, lower cost for us, but the whole country is, is potentially a, a, a able to participate. Um, we've also looked at the, the, the economics of this. Uh, either direct disposal of the spent fuel or uh, a, a, a closed uh, fuel cycle in which the spent fuel is re reprocessed and then the residual waste is, is disposed of. And it's clear that this is a, a technology which is ideally suited to the, to the volumes and types of waste which will be produced by the, the BWRX 300. Uh, so today's signature is, is important for us. It builds on the relationship we've, we've, we've taken forward already and gives us a framework for really working together to help Estonia uh, solve this problem in a, in a, in a, in a cost-effective and timely way. So, What date is it? <laughs> the 7th? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> And finally, this does not mean that this is a definite solution for Estonia, but this is a reference uh, solution for Fermi Energia. So, which means, um, well, that we will study it further, and we, but 
based on this reference technology, we will start responding to, to the questions and, um, and develop a detailed, more detailed plan to be compliant with the taxonomy requirements and, uh, yeah, to have a well financeable project. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kalev. We look forward to supporting you. And now for coffee, please. Let's continue with our program. Next, we are going to speak about the suitability of the Estonian bedrock for the geological final disposal of used nuclear fuel. And all this will be described by Ruth Hintz, head of the Department of Mineral Resources and Applied Geology from the Tallinn University of Technology. Please, the floor is yours. I understand that the issue is really, really interesting because we've got a full audience. But I will just pick up from where the previous speakers left off. As you heard, uh, uh, disposal of nu spent nuclear fuel is a critical issue for a nuclear plant to be created in Estonia. But I'm going to tell you about the suitability of the Estonian bedrock for the geological final disposal of used nuclear fuel. In addition to me, uh, we had other people who joined this group, uh, one of them present here as well, Rein Weikma. And uh, I've just uh, put down here the subjects that I am going to speak about uh, briefly. Uh, all my presentation could be looked at as a short lecture about the geology of our region. So what was the background of our study? Uh, so we tried to establish whether in the Estonian bedrock there are stable rock complexes that would be similar or comparable with neighboring Finland and Sweden and uh, final disposal uh, uh, places that they are creating there. And secondly, we wanted to know whether in the Estonian uh, air, uh, geology there would be criteria that would rule out the possibility of having a final disposal site in Estonia. And the third goal was to give our own opinion of the study conducted by uh, deep isolation in Estonia. Uh, you heard about this already today, and on the video screens there's also uh, material presented about deep uh, isolation. So this is a uh, survey about uh, boreholes to be used uh, in Estonia in the depth of 1.5 kilometers in Estonia. So what is the nature of uh, geological final disposal? The highly um, high-level waste has to be isolated from the um, environment, from the biological and hydrosphere for more than 10,000 years. That means that this uh, mechanism has to be passive to isolate um, the new, used nuclear fuel. And the concept is based on two big whales. One of them is the barrier systems. The barrier systems some of them are man-made, like containers, for example, but another one are natural barriers. And uh, the most important one uh, of the natural barriers is the rock complex itself in which the uh, waste is disposed of. Uh, and there is a number of criteria that have been already uh, established in order to evaluate whether one or the other site is suitable for geological final disposal. On this slide, you can see in green these criteria which we looked at in our survey. Some of the criteria are, are not um, applicable or relevant for Estonian geolog geology. Uh, when we look at the content, then, as I said, the first goal was to compare our neighboring areas. Uh, 
uh, and the geological final disposal sites in our neighboring uh, countries, um, Onkalo in Finland and Forsmark in um, Sweden. And in both of those sites, they have created uh, mm, mm, in very stable areas. Uh, in Onkala, uh, it is uh, in the depth of 520 meters. They are uh, uh, placed in uh, uh, metamorphic rock. And there's uh, mica gneiss areas. And um, uh, th they have uh, been developed in the Svecofenian orog orogenesis. So actually in the mesoproto so I come, uh, three main uh, systems of uh, fractures have been developed. And that means that in those rocks, the water permeability and uh, fracturing is very low. When we look at Froschmark, then it is in general terms a similar situation geologically. Again, we have uh, um, metamorphic rocks here. Uh, the site is within the depth of 500 meters, but uh, unlike Onkala site, uh, uh, the type of rock that is around there, uh, we have uh, um, um, tonalite, grandirite, granite rocks here. Again, uh, they have uh, been created in the process of uh, Svecofenian orogenesis, and in certain areas, uh, plastic deformations have uh, developed there. And after the orogenesis uh, in the Mesoproterozoicum and early Paleozoicum, uh, uh, some uh, uh, more uh, less stable deformations have occurred as well. And very often, they follow the same earlier plastic deformation zones. In between them are found tectonic lenses, and the rocks have very low water permeability, and uh, they are so-called dry rocks. And so what is the situation in Estonia in comparison? Estonia uh, is found in the same uh, Fenoscandian shield, but uh, uh, we have uh, the um, bedrock covered by sedimentary cover, and the bedrock is uh, the, the upper level of the bedrock is about 100 meters depth in North Estonia and even 700 meters depth in South Estonia. So how do we know this? Because these rocks of the bedrock are not, do not open up to the uh, level of the earth, surface of the earth. So we know this because we have uh, uh, drilled 500 uh, uh, boreholes into this um, bedrock, and we have also carried out geophysical uh, surveys. So we can say that the information that we have about the Estonian bedrock uh, is so much smaller than in Finland and Sweden, and because we have not, uh, because we cannot touch them on the uh, surface of the earth. But what we do know is that the Estonian bedrock, in the same way, consists of uh, metamorphic rocks. Uh, they have been deformed. In addition to, we also have uh, um, uh, igneous uh, rocks. And in, it is part of the same geological system that uh, um, Forschmark and Onkola have, uh, the, the, the Onkola sites. That uh, the Onkala final disposal site and uh, Forschmark site. So uh, they have the Estonian geology has also ge uh, emerged through this Fecofenian orogenesis. Uh, in North Estonia, the metamorphic rocks have a higher level of metamorphosis, in South Estonia, a lower level, and in between. Uh, there is the Baldiski-Pskov deformation zone. 
what does that mean when we speak about the Estonian bedrock as a suitable place for uh, final disposal of used nuclear fuel? Today, uh, by today, we have mapped the most important uh, uh, largest deformations and um, um, faulting uh, uh, zones. But if we wanted to know more about uh, uh, the water permeability in this bedrock, then we do not have too much information. But at the same time, the new uh, drill holes uh, in uh, Bakri uh, and in Yofi area prove the fact that in Estonian bedrock we have uh, uh, low um, uh, water permeability rocks that would be suitable in the same way as Onkala and Forschmak site for uh, final disposal of nuclear waste. But there's other mm, geological criteria as well, neotectonic uh, movements. The Estonian areas, uh, tectonic movements uh, are related to the uplift after the uh, ice age. Uh, this could be up to three millimeters a year in Estonia. Uh, it is uh, uh, twice as uh, low as in Onkola and Forschmak. And also, we have uh, low seismic activity. We do not have earthquakes. Uh, and if they are, their the magnitude is one to two and could only be higher in uh, uh, northwest Estonia and areas um, under sea there. At the same time, in the Forsmark site, the seismic activity is higher, actually, than in Estonia. We also briefly looked at uh, how the climate change in the future could change our coastline, whether there would be flooding in the areas and what, so, so, so whether the site could be left under sea water. But when we look at 10,000 years, then the Estonian area is actually uh, rising. So the, uh, the uplift after the ice age is compensating for the uh, uh, increase in uh, sea level that is the result of climate change. But this is actually not important because the disposal sites must remain unconnected with the uh, systems under the earth, even in the case when we'll have two kilometers of ice on Estonian earth. And the disposal site must have barriers that are effective even under such conditions. Definitely, when we're speaking about uh, Estonia uh, or any other area where people live is maintaining clean water, clean groundwater, and um, uh, uh, Estonia is different in principle from uh, Foschmark and the Finnish site as well, where the groundwater is bound into the same metamorphic rocks. In Estonia, our ground uh, mm, water is really bound into the sedimentary uh, c cover. And the sources of groundwater have been rainwater, glacial meltwater, and saline deep water. So what do we know? Do we know about the water in the bedrock in Estonia? Not much, because it has not been studied. Uh, only the uh, the uh, weathering grind, uh, rind has been studied in Estonia, but we know that there is no active water exchange between the water in the bedrock and in our um, mm, sedimentary cover does not exist. But how to establish this? How to find out the facts about this? Uh, in the Forschmark and Onkala, they have conducted isotopic uh, mm, uh, uh, studies um, for the uh, bedrock deep water, and they have established that the water levels have not uh, been actively participating in the water circulation during the past million years. When we look at the Estonian bedrock, then such studies have not been made, and we are speaking about the depth of 1.5 kilometers, then 
conventional isotopic uh, surveys cannot be conducted because they require water, but we assume that in this depth we have very dry rocks. And now a new uh, uh, noble ga gases, gases based solution has been proposed when uh, fluid inclusion can be used as well. That requires very small uh, quantities of water. Red White, who is present here today, is definitely able to share more information about this new method. In summary, uh, our survey proves that in Estonian bedrock, there are potentially suitable, stable rocks in the Estonian bedrock. Uh, we did not find a criteria that would rule out the possibility of final uh, disposal uh, site in Estonia. But at the same time, we have a number of challenges in these systems. And one of them is that not uh, uh, they have not uh, drilled into the depth of 1.5 meters yet so we do not have kilometers so we do not have information yet so we need um, more studies uh, concerning the layers and stratification of the rocks and the deep rock water all these studies are necessary in order to continue with this process but finally i would like to say that actually there is no ideal place or for final mm, uh, disposal sites. And every site like that is a technological uh, tailor-made job. And the better the geological information is, the better this tailor-made work is, the better the solution. Thank you. Any kind of power plant that makes energy, makes electricity from heat, that is coal, gas, oil, and of course nuclear, uh, only uses some of the heat. It gets a bunch of, uh, say, water, really, really hot, turns it into steam. The steam runs through a turbine. A useful part turns the turbine, and then you dump a bunch of waste heat out to make the area around the nuclear plant the best fishing hole in the country. But anyway, I like to say nowadays, it's only waste heat if you waste it. There are nuclear plants around the world that for decades have pr been providing incredibly cheap waste heat to local communities. A uh, particularly extreme example in a rich, expensive country in Switzerland, one of the nuclear plants provides community with heat at 10 euros a megawatt hour. That is profoundly inexpensive when gas prices, retail gas prices were up, uh, just the gas alone was many, many, many times that during the recent crisis and stays above that most of the time. And of course, this is carbon free. Now, Fermi and Agea has calculated that their project should be able to provide waste heat from a brand new nuclear plant that isn't amortized yet for about 30 euros a megawatt hour. That is about half of the legally mandated uh, uh, regulated rate for the communities that would stand to benefit from this. I'm pleased to say that Igor uh, Krupinski will be here to tell us more about how, in the Estonian context, nuclear waste heat can power communities. Thank you. So, yes, hello from my side. As I have seen, oi, vabandus ma tegelikult pidin eesti keel. Well, sorry, I was supposed to uh, uh, talk in Estonian. So, um, welcome on my behalf as well. Uh, I'm an engineer of heat energy, and I'm also the manager of Heat Consult and also the president of the Association of Estonian Engineers. And I was taking a look at the information that is exposed here, and um, there was some information about uh, bigger and smaller nuclear power plants 
And there it said that from bigger power plants uh, also waste heat can be used. But I would like to prove that the same is possible also uh, with um, uh, smaller uh, nuclear uh, plants. And um, uh, when uh, talking about experiences, we have uh, this uh, example of a Swiss uh, nuclear plant, and uh, it was mentioned that a representative uh, of uh, this uh, Swiss company is here. Maybe uh, this person could explain even more. But they are producing power, but at the same time also a lot of waste heat is created and waste heat can be used. And if you l look at the barometers, you can see that almost uh, 100 megawatts uh, is the installed power and the uh, um, uh, distance is 135 kilometers, the line length, which shows that it is possible to transport heat energy uh, based on uh, hot water uh, or vapor. Uh, and in uh, such circumstances, it's possible to transport it to uh, places that are far away uh, in long distances. And if uh, a nuclear power plant, let's uh, imagine is uh, placed in Aido area here on this picture. You can see uh, that engineers have um, uh, drawn this picture. And here um, you can see that a prospective nuclear power plant would be placed here. And heat can uh, be directed b both to the east as well as to uh, the uh, west and towards the west, we have uh, Bussi uh, and Kivili, and we have Kotlerve uh, 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 and Juhvi uh, on the other side. And so we have been trying to find out how uh, to use this waste heat. And in the beginning, we would have to find out how are these uh, cities heated nowadays. In Estonia, we uh, have a district heating act. And this market of district heating is uh, quite uh, strictly regulated. And now, if we take a look at the cities that I mentioned, there they are using fossil fuel, they are using natural gas, oil shale oil, and oil shale. And oil shale is slowly now taking steps back, and we should replace it with something. And we have calculated also what is the maximal heat energy production uh, and where the pipelines should be um, constructed. And as I say, district heating market is very much regulated and it's uh, the competition board that has uh, also defined the prices which is euros per megawatt hour. And as you can see, the most uh, favorable price is 61 uh, euros per megawatt hour. And the highest price is over 100 euros per megawatt hour. And based on this, we have also calculated what potentially the uh, need of uh, heat would be. And of course, we also put into the calculations that the top moments we could use boilers, etc. But otherwise, mainly it would be the nuclear, nuclear, nuclear heat. Uh, but um, yes, the necessity per year would be 856. And we have calculated here um, with 60 euros per megawatt hour, although it was said now earlier that it could be also 30 euros per megawatt hour. 
let's say, uh, a bit cheaper. And if uh, we uh, take all uh, this into consideration, then per year it would be possible to sell heat energy for more than 50 million euros. And as only the cheapest sellers can uh, come to the market, I think that this would also be feasible. And uh, as we would also have to transport heat to the nearest cities uh, uh, using uh, pre-isolated district heating piping systems. And we uh, have used also systems with piping uh, uh, on uh, the surface, uh, but uh, that would um, affect the price as well. So it has to be put under earth. And we uh, uh, have also uh, calculated it with a diameter of uh, 900 uh, millimeters. So Pusikivieli in uh, the uh, uh, western direction and in the eastern direction, the cities of Kotla, Erve, Jõhvi, Ahtme and Silama and Narva. And uh, talking about the engineering solution, we here have uh, three different solutions. And the easiest uh, solution would be to construct eight kilometers of pipelines to Pussy and Kivieli. And the price uh, with uh, nowadays prices would be uh, uh, 13 million uh, euros with pump stations, etc. And the uh, eastern uh, direction uh, with uh, all of the cities um, there, Kohtlaerva, uh, Jõhvi, Ahtme, etc., it would be uh, rather easy to involve uh, all uh, these cities. Uh, with a pipeline, uh, uh, 11 kilometers, that would cost 27 million euros. And if we would even add two other cities, Silama and Narva, that are situated even further towards uh, the east, the whole eastern part would be 73 kilometers all in all. We could supply uh, um, uh, heat uh, to uh, all uh, the whole area. And that would cost 335 million euros. That might seem a lot, but that would also safeguard um, stability in uh, heat uh, supply uh, with uh, stable prices. And that's all on my behalf. And uh, the, with this, I would also like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Aitäh. Osume siis järgmise ettekande juurde. Nii mõnegi tuuma ja oma... Well, we will now continue with the next uh, presentation. In many cases, when the construction uh, uh, period has uh, been much longer than uh, planned originally, but there are different examples as well where risk have been minimized in the beginning of the process. Merja Bukari, uh, who is a reactor physician, uh, we'll now talk about uh, lessons learned from large nuclear power plants construction works going over budget and over time. Please, Maria. Tere. Sõbrad ja vaenlased, uued ja vanad. Good afternoon, uh, friends and foes, new and old. I would like to share some lessons about creating uh, large nuclear power plants over the next 20 years, the well, last 20 years or so, without any uh, mm, warning, I would like to speak about something, the elephant in the room, rather. And so the painful question is, is nuclear energy always expensive? And in order not to speak about hypotheses, let's look at numbers. Let's look at the uh, total final cost of large plants that have been built in recent years. 
And this is what it looks like. I understand that many of you have seen these figures already. And if not, it's not a problem because we do not have to learn them by heart today. But I think you can see right away that total costs for the best and the last performers uh, vary about six times. And I do not want to analyze the specific numbers, but the goal for the purposes of today's presentation, I want to p divide them into expensive and affordable stations. You may have noticed that, OK, affordable are actually cheaper. Uh, this is no specialty of the political culture, cheaper uh, workforce, uh, no trade unions. Uh, so what are the factors? Uh, that influence, to a certain extent, the costs of uh, developing nuclear power plants. But the main, mainly the recent studies have shown that this is of secondary importance. But I'm going to speak about those factors that, in actual term, have uh, a bigger influence that can either increase or reduce the final cost of nuclear power plants. So in order for me to discuss total costs of nuclear power plants, it is important for us to be on the same page. We look at the simplified life cycle of a nuclear power plant. The life cycle starts generally from engineering. It will be built on paper first. That means all sorts of requirements, functions, descriptions of functions, specifications, all sorts of things, drawings, calculations, everything on the paper, engineering. At the same time, it is necessary to make sure that when the power plant uh, is actually built, uh, we, uh, it is necessary to deal with supply chains. If everything goes well, then the next phase is the construction phase, which is usually a short and intense period. Then operations. 40 to 80 years of generating electricity straight into the grid, at the same time taking care of waste management, and finally uh, the plant is decommissioned. This is a very simplified uh, overview of the life cycle of a nuclear power plant. Now the question that you should ask yourselves or ask me is, so which phases are expensive phases? So where we should put our focus? What makes uh, a nuclear power plant an expensive power plant? And the answer is very simple. Different surveys have shown that at least 70% of the total cost of the station across its life cycle is associated with its construction, construction activities, not specifically only uh, the construction activity where you uh, lay down the concrete, but also the preparatory steps leading to construction. What does that mean? It means that uh, uh, building a nuclear power plant uh, is a very capital intensive uh, job. You need capital before we have the team that is going to operate the plant, before we have generated anything. That also means that money has a price uh, or lending costs. Typically, about 20% of the actual final cost of the plant could be made up of lending costs or borrowing costs, rather. Uh, looking at a five-year construction period and a 7% interest rate. The longer the construction period, the higher the borrowing costs. So the construction phase should be very short, as short as possible. This is important. And this is where we see a big difference between the expensive and affordable ones. Large ones uh, uh, take a long time to build, hopefully small plants uh, will be built in a shorter time, which means that between the beginning of uh, the construction and uh, generating the first kilowatt hour is as short as possible. Speaking about small or large plants, then in Estonia, uh, this is my hypothesis, we have to, f in Estonia, we have to focus on the first steps. 
when at least 70% of the capital or total cost has to do with the first three steps, then let's try to eco economize there, which means that in this phase we need to learn from others' mistakes and uh, repeat success stories from others. But the good news is that over the past 10 to 20 years, which is a big problem for a whole nuclear power sector, uh, but these issues have been studied very carefully. So I'm going to share with you four lessons in 15 minutes. Hopefully we will manage with these uh, lessons. The first lesson, first paper, then concrete. <laughs> Already uh, the Estonian uh, folk uh, proverb uh, was that, uh, is that you have to measure nine times and only uh, cut one time. So what are the... Uh, the difference between expensive and affordable stations here. The expensive stations have been, have started uh, construction too soon or the construction period has been too long and it has been delayed and they didn't want to postpone the build, uh, building date, the first building date, which means that 40% of the design has been completed resulting in a longer construction, which means that every change that is being made on paper, which can be made fast, but those changes uh, are very difficult to uh, realize in supply chains, contracts, and in construction. Those who have done well have waited uh, until 70% of the detailed construction has been completed before they pour the first concrete. What does this mean for Estonia? Fermi has been saying from the very beginning that it is not possible to use Estonia as a guinea pig. Uh, we cannot build a first-of-a-kind reactor in Estonia. That means that someone else somewhere has uh, already created uh, the construction so that we can learn a lot from it. And I'm really happy that someone uh, has taken this on themselves so that we cannot do this. This specific step does not rule out the risk uh, entirely, but this is uh, one of the important things of uh, alleviating risks. Uh, lesson number two, to ensure high quality supply chain. Sounds uh, stupid maybe. So why should uh, supply chain make a big difference? But uh, the fact is that um, those who have built expensive stations have done so by from stagnated supply chains, which means that no new nuclear plant has been built in the past 20 years. Then, then demand is low, which means that uh, supply disappears, which means that uh, competences disappear, uh, the ability to understand uh, what uh, s nuclear specific requirements mean. Quality, what quality means, co competition means, and uh, this could lead to a situation uh, where when the competition is not too good, uh, we'll get mediocre products, mediocre services at premium prices. And this could also lead to a prolonged construction period. Those who have managed well in building uh, that means that they have uh, the established supply chains and when building a, a plant in Estonia, we have to keep this in mind as well because it is naive to think that Estonia is able to create its own cha supply chain from uh, zero to 100. But there are three things that we can gain from in Estonia. First, the building of l large plants. Uh, they have uh, uh, improved the development of supply chains. Secondly, we can also use the, the uh, help of our future and current partners who already have uh, their supply chains under control, whether uh, in North America, Korea, or Japan. And also, we should not forget that uh, when there is a demand for same or similar reactors in one region, then this also motivate, motivates the whole supply chain to start developing fast as well. Uh, then when it comes to Fermi, 
then Fermi keeps a very close eye on supply chains in order in order not to uh, have this bad uh, mm, these these bad surprises and saavutada on töötada koos regulaatoriga mitte regulaatori vastu ja seda eesmärgile tapa the third lesson learned is to uh, work together with the regulator in order to um, um, guarantee stability and no nuclear power plant um, wins on uh, a situation where parties do not understand each other. This has happened in a, a number of uh, nuclear power plants where development work has uh, not um, been good. If we don't understand the requirements, if we uh, cannot um, do anything in order to avoid uh, problems, uh, um, that can lead to problems. The uh, work amounts are increasing all the time, and uh, building works construction is postponed. So the developers who have as a goal to continue uh, to work and to work in a time, they have uh, also focused uh, at um, um, the topic of not introducing into any changes into the projects. And now, uh, in uh, Estonia, we don't know yet whether the relationship with the regulator would be in A or B category, because we don't have any regulators in Estonia yet. But um, uh, I can see also positive aspects in it, because the rest uh, of the world is moving towards standardization, which means that uh, the working regime and uh, attitudes of regulators will probably be changed, or there is a need for that. Uh, but in uh, uh, Estonia, uh, the, the goal would be uh, not to be a breaking factor in this process, but to guarantee safety. And the fourth lesson learned is something that combines the previous lessons learned is um, uh, to use experienced project teams. What, what does it mean, project, um, uh, an experienced project uh, team, a good project team, uh, in addition to what is obvious? A good and experienced project team is a team who learns based on uh, uh, previous lessons learned and that understands that it's important to manage risks in uh, engineering, in uh, uh, supply chains, uh, for uh, the construction period to be as short as possible, because good uh, project teams in uh, this process uh, mean uh, money in reality. And the shorter the building uh, phases has been, the, um, the lower the costs in general. So. Uh, it is important to keep uh, the period of pouring the first concrete to the moment of selling the f first kilowatt hour of energy as short as possible. And this is an aspect that sometimes has been neglected, and it has finally cost also a lot of money. And I think that in Estonia we do have this experience that we, we cannot go to any company asking them to take this task, which means that unavoidably we have to turn to teams who have carried out big nuclear plants. And in a perfect world, they would have constructed in exactly the same kind of a nuclear power plant as we would like to construct here. So these were the four lessons learned, um, and um, I really hope that you would agree that uh, nuclear uh, power plants uh, 
can be expensive, but there is no need for them to be expensive. Everything depends on how we build them, construct them. So, in other words, they don't have to be expensive, and there is a possibility for us to learn based on others' mistakes. And we can avoid uh, mistakes that others have made. And therefore, I would like to suggest that Estonia would not only learn and be aware what these lessons learned are, uh, but uh, I don't know about you, but I would like to build an affordable plant. That is all uh, from me. Compared to the last year, uh, almost a renaissance of nuclear power has uh, taken place in uh, the world. On COP28, there were several countries that promised to triple the amounts of uh, produced uh, nuclear energy. On the other hand, there are also countries where nuclear power plants have been closed down. And we believe that Estonia is a country with smart people, and it has deserved also um, smart uh, uh, energy and smart decisions. Now, uh, the conference of smart people, smart energy is coming to its end. And you are welcome to continue their discussions uh, either here uh, or also in a June Imperium on Telliskevi 61. I think it's been an extremely interesting day. Uh, those of you who have been to this conference know that we're not going to end without hearing uh, the famous Fermi speech from Kalev. But for what I have to say, I, we're all looking forward to joining you after this speech for drinks here and on at the Juniperian Distillery at uh, Teleskivi 60M address. It's one of the finest gin distilleries in the world, befitting one of the finest nuclear conferences in the world. Before I sign off for the day and, and have Kalev coming up, I want to say thank you to Fermi and to all of you willing to attend that makes it worthwhile for Fermi to put this on every year. Between the translations, the choice of topic titles, the extreme practical nature of many of the discussions and the presentations we've had, and finally, the permanent place that the live stream recording of this event shows up on the website, Fermi Conference is a valuable gift to the global nuclear community, including those who would want to follow in the footsteps of Kalev and explore adding nuclear to their countries. So thank you so much to the Fermi team. I send the link around all the time. And of course, we have to add the spicy final moment, probably the most entertaining speech you're going to see at a nuclear energy conference. Caleb, comments. Thank you. It's a. So, Dano. Thank you. Um, this is not um, entertainment, but let me remind you why we call our company Fermi Energia and the inspiration from Enrico Fermi. Here you can see a, um, a, one of the graphite piles that Fermi put together. But how was it possible for Enrico Fermi to achieve in 1942 the first nuclear uh, self -sustain nuclear reactor, self-sustaining chain reaction. Was this a moment of genius or just per implementing a long-term plan? But actually it was neither, because back in 1940, in March, when Fermi was, uh, was speaking for the U.S. Navy uh, about the possibility of uh, nuclear uh, chain reaction, he was very uh, spectical, uh, skeptical and even more spe skeptical than the social Estonian social democrats about the modular plant. But it was uh, Leo Szilard who convinced him from November 1940 to use the first uh, funding of uh, US government of $200,000 uh, to test graphite and uh, uh, fine uranium particles, but even the best. Heli, Heli. 
speakers cannot hear the the, the interpreters cannot hear the microphone from, from the speakers. <laughs> Even the best graphite was uh, enriched by boron, and Szilard developed new methods on how to get a sufficiently clean and dry graphite. Fermi was make, carrying out um, calculations. A dozen of uh, New York, Columbia University, uh, American uh, football players uh, carried hundreds of kilograms of graphite. And the first pile in September 41 finally achieved the reproduction constant of neutrons of 0 0.87. This was very far from the required one. During the next 15 months, the program moved to Chicago, place where Mark comes from. And millions of dollars were uh, set aside for this. The project team grew, new equipment was developed, and uh, in total, Fermi, during the two years, um, uh, was ahead of putting together 27 graphite piles before Chicago Pile 1. And it was only in April 1942, K was still 0 0.918. The last pile started to be developed uh, in, with Fermi in charge 24-7, uh, starting from the 16th of November 2042 and using 12-hour shifts. And this was when K1 was achieved. Altogether, there were 57 layers of, uh, in the, in the mm, pile. It was a three-meter high pile and 7.6 meters wide. And the cost of the pile was 5 million US dollars in today's money, and it worked like clockwork. Four minutes was enough to prove that the chain reaction works. And why I am speaking about this, the key method of how this result was achieved was experimenting or iteration with using another term, testing, 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 making things step by step better. You do not have the final result immediately. Some people are saying, Enrico, you're a genius. You be given the Nobel Prize. Tell us the exact plan. How will, how much will it cost? When do you deliver this? I need this plan right now and here. This is not real life. Testing experimenting, uh, and Bent Flüffberg calls this uh, I creative iteration in his book, uh, How Big Things Get Done. And this is a key activity for us in Fermi Energia. We've been said that, uh, said that uh, why, asked why we gave up the original molten salt reactor. But this was not a goal in itself. BWRX 300 is not a goal in itself either. The goal is to provide uh, uh, reliable, safe, uh, affordable energy to Estonian consumers. And we have to test things all the time, improve, uh, improve our time frame and budget, take into account the latest knowledge, the most important considerations, avoid uh, time, spending, of, wasting of time and alleviating risks over and over again. This is difficult, this is not nice and, and good, but it shouldn't be like this. Uh, you, the main thing is that you need to have results. This is what Fleifberg says in his book, how Pixar could uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, success by experimenting, long-term experimenting. This is a uh, also, Frank Gehry, the architect, who has been able to achieve uh, 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 the good results in his work. Obviously, Enrico Fermi was not the only person who was testing and experimenting in developing nuclear energy. There were thousands and thousands of scientists and from many, many countries. Thanks to them, we know how nuclear energy at, uh, atoms, uh, um, isotopes, uh, uh, the neutron absorption cross sections, retarder uh, mm, properties, radiation effect, and radioelectrolysis work. In this, 
so that they know everything so well in these areas. In the same way that Ruth was speaking here about things that uh, uh, seem to be very complicated for those who do not know the thing. But this is quite simple. Uh, these are not artificial things. This is like one plus one uh, is not artificial. This is real nature. So it is our obligation as people to study this and know this. And this is what Fermi does. Uh, the other thing that connects us with Enrico Fermi is that he was um, a teacher to many uh, then young physicians and physicists and uh, also uh, people who got uh, the Nobel Prize. We in Fermi, in the five years, we have invested quite a lot of our time and money into teaching the new generation in our field. We've uh, had scholarships, uh, summer schools, and we are inspired by the same thing that inspired Enrico Fermi, by seeing how young people acquire physics, complicated um, knowledge, and bring this forward. This is like a miracle. Reiner and all the others, young people who, uh, who, have, uh, who have studied in our summer schools. So, so this is the reason why we've had more than 100 lectures about uh, uh, nuclear energy, why you support the LAE end program, and we praise all these teachers who make Estonian children and young people wiser. The fact that Estonia has been for several years uh, uh, has been at the absolute top uh, of the PISA education score mm, is this is a uh, Quite, uh, this is a precondition uh, that at one point and first Estonian scientist will be awarded the Nobel Prize. This also means that we will be able to create the nuclear power plant and operate it. And when we have all these um, representatives of nations uh, where uh, Nobel Prizes have been awarded already, uh, but per capita, I think we've been able to manage complicated and difficult things. And then speaking about knowledge and critically speaking about knowledge, knowledge does not come cheap or nor does it come quickly. You cannot get a doctor's uh, uh, the, uh, degree in one year. It takes time to acquire this knowledge. Uh, I, for example, work nine years in order to get my doctoral uh, degree. And it's not cheap either, but there is no other way. There is no other way. Yeah, we may do things in a stupid way or do not dare find solutions. No. This is, this is not what we go for. Estonians are not like that. And I really believe that this is so. And it seems to me that the president does believe in this as well. And the th uh, the third uh, feature of Enrico Fermi, which is also important for us here in er Fermi Energia, is being in good mood. A young Enrico Fermi also liked these jokes, like Richard Feynman, who in Los Alamos uh, picked a lock of a safe containing nuclear secrets and left a note there. Guess who? Hmm. Yes, who did that? <laughs> so Fermi, Enrico Fermi was never cold or group, group grumpy or wicked. He rather uh, was similar to Anto Raukas, another person who is important for the uh, nuclear energy um, knowledge in Estonia. But yes, in Europe, we have a war going on. And the moods and the economic uh, uh, re, uh, decrease. Nothing is good like that. But we also need to have a, a good mood. This is also natural for human beings. Whether you go to work and do something out of a sense of mission or and with uh, what kind of attitude you have, or what kind of mood you have. But physics and the science and the process of doing things so complicated 
and the history and the background all there. This is so inspiring, at least for me. And I have also seen how this works for other people as well. Uh, this is something that keeps the nuclear energy community together, not only in Estonia, but elsewhere as well. It is inspiring and brings us together. Uh, um, we have uh, the goals de of decarbonization, energy security. This is um, something that every country, every economy has to achieve for sustainability, also for political uh, stability. And that makes it uh, worth a while, irrespective of all sorts of questions, criticism, doubts, which are also justified in very often. This journey is a long journey to start using nuclear energy. There's also a lot of unknowns there. And today, we do not have answers to all questions. Just as Enrico Fermi, back in 1940, uh, in March, did not have answers to all these questions. How much it's going to cost, what these reactors are going to look like that did not exist yet, how much nuclear energy in which countries and under what conditions will be developed in the world. In the same way, we have to find answers to many questions. It takes time, takes uh, effort and money, but as, you can, as we can see from other countries, it is worth it. The countries that have taken the effort, Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, and other countries, there's examples to show that uh, nuclear energy provides long-term stability, which is important for a country. They do not uh, push out other f uh, forms of energy, but they do provide stability for many people and also for many people exciting and interesting activities. And if and through a mental effort, they uh, prove that we can manage difficult things. So this is a big uh, uh, issue and thank you for joining us on our fifth conference and we'll meet again in next February. Thank you for coming and see you at the after party. Thank you. I would also like to invite uh, uh, the Fermi uh, team for a family photo.